Richard Trenton Chase had a thing for blood. He also had a fear of disintegrating. He would hold oranges on his head, believing vitamin C would be absorbed by his brain via diffusion. Chase also believed that his cranial bones had become separated and were moving around, so he shaved his head to be able to watch this activity. Born May 23, 1950, he liked to set fires as a child and to torment animals. He had a sister, four years younger, and his father was a strict disciplinarian who bickered constantly with his wife. By the time Richard was 10, he was killing cats. As a teenager, he drank and smoked marijuana, getting into trouble several times but showing no shame over it. He dated several girls, one of whom reported that Rick was unable to perform sexually because he could not keep an erection. This problem bothered him, and when he was 18, he went to see a psychiatrist. He learned that a root cause of impotence was repressed anger. The psychiatrist also thought he might be suffering from a major mental illness, but did not suggest he be committed. After he moved out of his parents' home, he went through a series of roommates, many of whom reported his bizarre behavior and heavy drug use. Even the few friends he had considered him weird. Once he nailed shut his bedroom closet door because people were invading his space from in there. He was preoccupied with any sign that something was wrong with him, which held true throughout his adult life, and he once entered an emergency room looking for the person who had stolen his pulmonary artery. He also complained that the bones were coming out through the back of his head, that his stomach was backward, and that his heart often stopped beating. Another psychiatrist diagnosed him as paranoid schizophrenic, but thought he might actually be suffering from drug-induced toxic psychosis. He was put under observation for 72 hours, and it was recommended that he stay, but he was allowed to leave whenever he wanted without obtaining permission. Eventually, he was released. His life grew increasingly slovenly, and he submersed into hypochondria and drug abuse. He was 5 foot 11 and weighed only 145 pounds. He lived with his mother for a while, now divorced, but believed he was being poisoned. His father made him move out and got him an apartment. Chase soon began to kill and disembowel rabbits that he either caught or bought and to eat their entrails raw. Sometimes he would put the intestines with the animal's blood into a blender, liquefy them, and drink this concoction in an effort to keep his heart from shrinking to the point of disappearing from his body. He once injected rabbit blood into his veins and got very ill. He believed this rabbit had ingested battery acid that had seeped into his stomach, but in fact, he had a bad case of blood poisoning. Finally, he was committed as a schizophrenic suffering from somatic delusions. The doctors tried antipsychotic medications, which failed to work, indicating that his psychosis may have been precipitated by his drug abuse. In 1976, he escaped and showed up at his mother's house. He was returned to the hospital, ending up at Beverly Manor, a facility for mental patients, where he earned the nickname Dracula. He often spoke about killing rabbits, and one day he was found with blood around his mouth. Two dead birds, their necks broken, lay outside his window the classic Renfield syndrome. Eventually, he was released and deemed no longer a danger to anyone. That's what they believed, anyway. His parents were granted a conservatorship, renewed annually, and his mother paid his rent and shopped for his groceries. Chase moved into another apartment and began to catch and torture cats, dogs, and rabbits. He killed them to drink their blood. Sometimes he stole neighborhood pets, and once he even called a family whose dog was missing to tell them what he had done to the animal. He bought guns and started to practice with them. Although he was on psychiatric medication, he remained unsupervised. His mother weaned him from the medications herself, deciding that he did not really need them. In 1977, the court-awarded conservatorship expired, and his parents did nothing to renew it, leaving Chase on his own. One day, he paid his mother a visit. She heard a loud noise and opened the door to see her son holding a dead cat. He threw the animal to the ground and tore it open, smearing the blood all over his face and neck. His mother failed to act and never reported the incident. On August 3rd that same year, police officers found Chase's Ford Ranchero stuck in sand near Pyramid Lake in Nevada. Two rifles lay on the seat, along with a pile of men's clothing, blood smears on the inside, and a blood-filled white plastic bucket containing a liver made them suspicious. When they spotted Chase through binoculars, he was nude and covered in blood. He saw them and ran but they caught up with him and took him back to his pickup. He claimed that the blood was his. It had seeped out of him. The liver, it turned out, was from a cow. Chase soon became a fan of the Hillside Strangler, operating not far away, and he avidly read the newspaper articles about the killings. He had guns, 
He had a fear of other people, and he had no sense of boundaries, a lethal combination, even without his weird blood fantasies. Soon, he grew bolder. It was December 29, 1977. The man's name was Ambrose Griffin. He was 51, an engineer, and the father of two sons. He had been yelling at something or someone, his wife reported to homicide cops in the emergency room, and he turned and just dropped right there in front of her. She'd heard two odd popping noises, but had given them no thought. They had just returned from a shopping trip, and Mrs. Griffin had opened the trunk of the car and taken out the bag of potatoes. Her husband had followed with two sacks of groceries and had been on his way back to the car when he had dropped, presumably from a heart attack. Soon she would learn a more horrifying truth. Her husband had been shot in some sort of random drive-by attack. One of the Griffin boys reported having seen a man with a rifle walking around in their East Sacramento neighborhood. They tailed him and they called the police, but it turned out not to be their man. His gun was not the 22 caliber murder weapon. The following day, a news crew found two spent shell casings on the pavement near the Griffin residence. Detectives followed up on reports of a suspicious car driving around the neighborhood, but could get no clear description. On the afternoon of the Griffin shooting, a 12-year-old boy reported that a man with brown hair, seemingly in his 20s, had shot at him from a brown Pontiac Trans Am as he rode his bike. He was put under hypnosis and recalled a license plate number, 219-EEP. It led nowhere. Routine police work turned up a report from a woman who said that a shot had been fired into her home on December 27th. She lived only a few blocks from the Griffins. A search of her kitchen produced a 22 caliber slug. It proved to have been fired from the same gun that had killed Ambrose Griffin. At that point, all leads dried up. On January the 11th, 1978, Don Larson had a strange encounter with Chase. During the six months that they had been neighbors in the same East Sacramento apartment complex on Watt Avenue, she had seen him carry three animals into his apartment, against the rules, but had never seen those animals again. She thought him odd, but worried that he was lonely. He asked her for a cigarette. She gave him one, but he stopped her from walking away. When she gave him the rest of the pack, he let her go. Nearly two weeks later, on the 23rd, at 2909 Bernice Street, Jean Layton spotted an unkempt young man with longish hair strolling toward her. She watched as he tried her patio door, found it locked, and went to the windows. They too were locked, so he came back to the door. Mrs. Layton met him there, face to face. He showed no emotion whatsoever as he scrutinized her. Then he turned, paused to light a cigarette, and walked away through her backyard. Down the street, Robert and Barbara Edwards were bringing their groceries into the house when they heard a noise outside. Whoever was in there apparently heard them and started to run. They heard a window slam at the back of the house and then, oddly, a disheveled young man came around the corner toward them. Though Edwards tried to stop him, he sprinted past and got out into the street. Edwards gave chase but lost him when he jumped a fence. The police arrived to find the house in shambles, with theft of valuables the obvious motive. However, he had also urinated into a drawer of freshly laundered baby's clothing and had defecated on a child's bed. The intruder kept going, veering off his path here and there to walk across the front porches of random houses. Then he came to a tract house at 2360 Tioga Way. FBI agent Robert Ressler once asked Chase how he selected his victims. He said that he went down the streets testing doors to find one that was unlocked. If the door was locked, he said, that means you're not welcome. Apparently, he found the door at the Wallen home unlocked. He encountered Teresa Wallen, 22 and 3 months pregnant. Before entering, Chase deposited a 22 caliber bullet in the mailbox. He opened the door and ran into Terry as she was taking out the garbage. She dropped the bag as he raised his pistol and shot her twice. One bullet entered her palm, held up defensively, and traveled up her arm to exit out of her elbow and nick her neck. The other went through the top part of her skull. She fell and Chase then knelt over her prostate body, firing another bullet into her temple. His next move was to drag her into the bedroom, leaving a trail of blood behind. He then retrieved a knife from the kitchen and an empty yogurt container from the trash bag that Terry had been carrying. When David Wallen came home that night at six, he found the house dark. He entered and saw their dog, a German shepherd, waiting outside, but his wife was nowhere to be found. Oddly, the stereo was on. A bag of trash and what appeared to be oil stains on the carpet troubled him. He followed the stains to the bedroom. Then, he began to scream. His wife lay just inside the door on her back. Her sweater was pulled up over her breasts and her pants and underwear down around her ankles. 
Her left nipple was carved off, her torso cut open below the sternum, and her spleen and intestines pulled out. Chase had stabbed her repeatedly in the lung, liver, diaphragm, and left breast. He also had cut out her kidneys and severed her pancreas in two. He placed the kidneys together back inside her. There was blood in the bathroom, and it was later learned that Chase had smeared Terry's blood all over his face and hands, licking it off his fingers. The discarded yogurt container near her body was also bloodstained, as if he had used it to drink her blood. The most heinous act, however, was to stuff animal feces into her mouth. There were odd rings of blood around the body, as if someone had placed a bucket there. Two days later, a puppy was found killed and mutilated not far from the Wallen home. A strange man with stringy hair and driving a ranchero had bought two puppies from the family with seemingly no concern whether he got males or females. And then they found one of the puppies from the litter dead. On January 27th, Evelyn Miroth, 38, was babysitting her 20-month-old nephew in her home, one mile from the Wallen residence. Her 51-year-old friend, Dan Meredith, came over. Evelyn was about to send her son, Jason, 6, to a friend's house, and when Jason failed to arrive, the friend sent her daughter over to check. The little girl saw movement inside from the front window and then turned around to report that no one had answered the door. Neighbors grew worried, and one finally entered the house and saw what had happened that morning. Danny Meredith lay in the hallway in a pool of blood. The deputy who checked him saw a gunshot wound on his head and then saw blood in the bathroom and what looked like bloody water in the tub. Then he found Evelyn lying naked on the bed in her bedroom, her legs splayed open. She had a gunshot wound to her head, and her abdomen had been cut open, and her intestines pulled out. Two carving knives, stained red, lay nearby. It appeared that she had been taking a bath when surprised by her killer, and then dragged to the bed. He sodomized her, stabbed her through the anus into her uterus at least six times, made several slices across her neck, and tried to cut out an eye. Bloody ringlets on the carpet indicated he had once again used some kind of container to collect blood. He stabbed several internal organs as well, which the coroner later noted would facilitate getting at blood in the abdomen. On the other side of the bed, police officers discovered the body of a boy, who turned out to be Jason. He had been shot twice in the head at close range. The intruder had left bloody footprints behind, which resembled the shoe marks found at the Wallen murder scene. Then they located an 11-year-old girl in the neighborhood who described the man near the victim's residence around 11 o'clock. She described him in his early 20s. He fit the description of a man seen repeatedly in that area walking around asking people for magazines. Dan Meredith's red station wagon was missing from the front of the house where neighbors had seen it parked that morning. Then Karen Ferreira arrived, seeking the whereabouts of her son, David, left with her sister-in-law, Evelyn, that morning. No one had seen him, but a bullet hole was discovered in the pillow that had been in a crib. There was a lot of blood. It later turned out that Chase had drunk Evelyn's blood and had mutilated the baby's body in the bathroom. A knock on the door must have interrupted him, and he had fled with the body. As the police looked for him, he took the baby to his home and severed the head. He removed several organs and consumed them. It seemed to Chase that he would get away with this brutal series of murders but he did not realize how quickly the police were closing in. Meredith's station wagon was found abandoned not far from the murder scene, the keys still in it. There was little hope that the baby was still alive. The police did not know it, but the parking lot where they located the missing car was only about 100 yards from apartment 15 of the Watt Avenue complex where Richard Trenton Chase lived. The FBI was already on the case. Robert Ressler and Russ Vorpagel developed a profile of who they were probably looking for. They figured him for a disorganized killer as opposed to an organized one, with some clues pointing toward the possibility of psychosis. He clearly had not planned these crimes and did little to hide or destroy evidence. He left footprints and fingerprints and had probably walked around in daylight with blood on his clothing. In other words, he gave little thought to the consequences. At the very least, his domicile would be as sloppy as the places he ransacked after he was finished with them, and the fact that the murder scenes were fairly close together meant he might not have a car. In fact, he'd taken a car from one house, so he must have walked to that one at least. That meant it was likely that he lived in the vicinity of the crimes. It was also likely that he would kill again and keep on killing until he was caught. They had to work fast. They figured him to be a white male in his mid-twenties, thin and undernourished. Evidence of the crimes, they were sure, would be found in his residence, and if he had a vehicle, in there as well. 
He either would have a history of medical illness or drug use, or both, and he would be something of a loner. They thought he was probably employed at some menial labor or unemployed, given his apparent state of mind, and could be receiving some disability money. He probably lived alone. He might be paranoid. Many people were questioned around the area, and some had seen a white male driving a red station wagon. Although the police artist tried to make a sketch, few of the descriptions were helpful, except for that of a young woman. On the same day that Robert Edwards had chased the intruder away from his home on Bernice Street, Nancy Holden had had an odd encounter. She was shopping in the town and country village shopping center, not far from Watt Avenue and close to the Wallen residence, when she saw a strange man approaching her who appeared to be confused. She tried to avoid him, but he directed a question at her. Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? He asked. Nancy was startled. Ten years earlier, she had dated a boy named Kurt, who had been killed on a motorcycle. It was then that she noticed something vaguely familiar about this interrogator. She asked him who he was and he replied, Rick Chase. She was astonished. This man before her was nothing like the studious, clean-cut Rick Chase that she had known in high school. She had heard he'd gotten into drugs, and looking at him now, she realized those rumors were true. He was grimy and stained, and his agitated manner made her nervous. She talked with him for a few minutes, seeking a way out, and finally got out of the store while he was still paying for something. However, he followed her into the parking lot, intent on getting a ride. She managed to get into her car, roll up the windows, lock the doors, and pull out before he could stop her. She knew she'd been rude, but she just wanted to get away. After viewing the police sketch of a disheveled man seen in the neighborhood wearing an orange ski parka, and recalling that Chase wore one that day the same color, she was sure this was the man the police were seeking. They also got another clue from the gun registration of a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun sold in December 1977 to a Richard Chase on Watt Avenue. On January 10th, he had purchased ammunition. Then Don Larson, watching the news, recalled her strange neighbor. She had seen a large map of Sacramento on his wall, marked with black ink. However, she was afraid to make an enemy by reporting him. After hearing from Holden five days after the Wallen murder, the detectives ran a background check on Chase and found a history of mental illness, including his escape from a hospital, a concealed weapons charge, a series of minor drug busts, and his arrest in Nevada. They found his address on Watt Avenue and went out that Saturday afternoon, one day after the triple murder, to check it out. They learned from the apartment manager that Chase's mother paid his rent and that she felt her son was the victim of LSD abuse. Chase refused to let his mother into his apartment. The detectives knocked repeatedly, but Chase would not open the door. They pretended they were going to leave and then waited. Chase emerged with a box in his arms and made his way towards his car. The detectives apprehended him, but not without a mighty struggle on his part. They noticed he was wearing an orange parka that had dark stains on it, and his shoes appeared to be covered in blood. A 22 semi-automatic handgun was taken from him, which also had blood stains on it. Then they found Dan Meredith's wallet in Chase's back pocket, along with a pair of latex gloves. The contents of the box he was carrying also proved interesting, pieces of blood-stained paper and rags. They took him to the police station and tried to get him to confess. He admitted to killing several dogs, but stubbornly resisted talking about the murders. While he was in custody, detectives searched his apartment in hopes of finding a clue about the missing baby. What they found in the putrid-smelling place was disgusting. Nearly everything was bloodstained, including food and drinking glasses. In the kitchen, they found several pieces of bone and some dishes in the refrigerator with body parts. One container held human brain tissue. An electric blender was badly stained and smelled of rot. There were three pet collars, but no animals to be found. Photographic overlays on human organs from a science book lay on a table, along with newspapers on which ads selling dogs were circled. A calendar showed the inscription, Today, on the dates of the Wallen and Miroth murders. And chillingly, the same word was written on 44 more dates yet to come during that year. The entire place had an ominous feeling, but at least, Chase was now in custody. Evidence was gathered from Chase to compare to samples already being analyzed in the crime lab from the murder victims. There was plenty of blood on Chase's clothing, and they also took hair samples. However, when they tried to take a blood sample, he had to be restrained. They had no idea then of his intense primal fear of losing his blood. Ferris Salami was appointed Chase's attorney, 
and he was immediately separated from the detectives who had spent so much time trying to extract a confession. Police officers continued to search for the baby using a bloodhound. They even went to Chase's mother's home, and she was uncooperative, insisting that despite what they had found, it did not prove that her son had done anything. At one point, Chase admitted to another inmate that he had drunk the blood of his victims because he had blood poisoning. He needed blood, and he had grown tired of hunting and killing animals. Finally, the baby was found. On March 24th, a church janitor came upon a box containing the remains of a male baby. He called the police. When they arrived, they recognized the clothing. It was the missing boy from the Miroth home. The baby had been decapitated, and the head lay underneath the torso, which was partially mummified. A hole in the center of the head indicated the child had been shot. There were several other stab wounds to the body, and several ribs were broken. Beneath the body, too, was a ring of keys that fit Dan Meredith's now-impounded car. The lead prosecutor for the case of California v. Richard Trenton Chase was Ronald W. Tochterman. He intended to seek the death penalty. The defense entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, but Tochterman was determined to show that he knew the difference between right and wrong and that he was not compelled to murder. Part of his strategy included boning up on the legends of Dracula. He also read about blood-related crimes and blood rituals in various cultures, noting that some people believed that ingesting another person's blood would strengthen or heal them. He wanted to show that while this might be a belief, it was not a viable reason for murder. A change of venue was requested, given the local notoriety of the case, and the trial was moved 120 miles south to Santa Clara County. By the time it was all over, a dozen psychiatrists had examined Chase. He admitted to one that he was disturbed about killing his victims and he was afraid they might come from from the dead. There was no evidence in his admissions that he had ever felt compelled. He simply thought the blood was therapeutic. One psychiatrist found him to be an antisocial personality, not schizophrenic. His thought processes were not disrupted and he was aware of what he had done and that it was wrong. On January 2, 1979, the trial began. Chase was charged with six counts of murder. The prosecutor emphasized throughout the trial that Chase had had a choice and mentioned several times that he had brought rubber gloves with him to the victims' homes with the intent of murder. Altogether, there were 250 prosecution exhibits, the strongest of which were Chase's gun and Dan Meredith's wallet found in Chase's pocket. The first witness in a trial that stretched across four months was David Wallen, who described the scene of horror he had encountered upon coming home that day. Nearly 100 witnesses followed him. Chase then took the stand in his own defense. He looked awful, having dropped in weight to 107 pounds. His eyes were sunken and lusterless. He claimed to have been semi-conscious during the Wallen murder, and he described in detail the way he had been mistreated much of his life. He admitted to drinking Wallen's blood. He did not recall much about the second series of murders, but knew that he had shot the baby in the head and decapitated it, leaving it in a bucket in the hope of getting more of its blood. He thought the baby was something else, but did not elaborate. He thought that his problems stemmed from his inability to have sex with girls as a teenager, and he said he was sorry for the killings. The defense asked for a verdict of second-degree murder to spare Chase the death penalty since he was clearly insane and had never been given proper help. Tochterman argued that he was a sexual sadist, a monster who knew what he was doing and who could not be salvaged. On May 8, 1978, after five hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of six counts of first-degree murder. During the sanity phase, the jury found Chase legally sane after deliberating an hour. It took them four hours to decide that Chase should die in the gas chamber at San Quentin Penitentiary. While interviewing killers all over the country to add information about criminal psychology to their database, FBI profilers visited Richard Chase and learned about some of his oddities. Robert Ressler recounts his encounter in a book, Whoever Fights Monsters. He describes how Chase had believed in 1976 that his blood was turning to powder and that he thus needed blood from other creatures to replenish it. Nevertheless, the psychiatrists had released him, despite protests from some of the staff that he was dangerous. From the time he was arrested in Nevada in August 1977 until the murders began in December paints a clear picture of a deteriorating mind. It was after that that he had killed his mother's cat and bought two dogs to kill. He also tormented a neighborhood family about their missing dog. He then collected articles on the Hillside Strangler. Then, in December, he acquired his gun. 
After the Griffin killing, he bought a newspaper and kept an editorial page about the senseless nature of that shooting. Then he bought more ammunition. He also set a fire in his neighbor's garage to drive them from the neighborhood because their music annoyed him. He told a psychiatrist that the first killing had happened after his mother would not allow him to visit for Christmas. He was just shooting his gun out the window of his car. That he had fired shots at other houses indicated it was not altogether an accident. Chase told the FBI profilers that he had killed to preserve his own life and he was developing an appeal based on that. He mentioned soap dish poisoning. Ressler asked him what that was and he explained that everyone has a soap dish. If you lift the soap and find that underneath it's dry, you're all right. If it's gooey, you have the poisoning, which turns your blood to powder. The powder then depletes your energy and eats away at your body. Chase also said that he was Jewish, which he was not, and that he'd been persecuted by Nazis because he had a Star of David on his forehead, which he didn't. He explained that the Nazis were connected to UFOs, which had telepathically commanded him to kill to replenish his blood. These UFOs followed him around, and the FBI should be able to pinpoint them by putting a radar on him. He then shoved a cup at Wrestler, filled with part of a macaroni and cheese dinner. He wanted it analyzed for poison. Wrestler learned that the other inmates taunted Chase and urged him to kill himself. They did not want him near them. Wrestler, along with the prison mental health professionals, felt he ought to be transferred to a psychiatric hospital. Although he was sent to one for a short time, he soon returned to San Quentin. On the day after Christmas in 1980, one day short of the third anniversary of the killing spree, the guard looked in on Richard Chase. The condemned man was lying on his back in his bunk, breathing normally. He did not return the guard's greeting, which was not unusual. At 11.05, the same guard looked into the cell again. Chase was on his stomach, both legs extended off his bunk, and his feet were on the floor. His head was against the mattress, and his arms extended toward the pillow. The guard called out to Chase, who failed to move. He went in and pulled Chase off the bed. It was clear to him that the Vampire of Sacramento, a.k.a. Dracula, was dead. K.P. Holmes, the coroner, was called. He searched the cell and located a strange suicide note after taking some pills. Chase had been taking a daily dose of Cinequin for hallucinations and depression, which came to his cell in a package of three pills. Apparently, he had hoarded the pills and then overdosed. The cause of his death was toxic ingestion. His heart was found to be normal and in good shape, despite his lifelong concerns. The prison psychiatrist noted that Chase had been psychotic since the time he had entered the prison, but no one much bothered about the nature of his bizarre obsession with blood. In 1992, a movie called Unspeakable was made based on Chase as a model for the killer. His case is still used by the FBI as the archetypal model for understanding the disorganized killer. A number of people, both witnesses and historians, have tried to accurately document the facts of what happened on February 28, 1993, in Waco, Texas, in the clash between law enforcement and a religious group known as the Branch Davidians. No one seems able to write about those events in an unbiased manner, since it seems that the whole thing was preventable. Even the academics appear to have a cause, so it's difficult at times to piece together what exactly happened and who was to blame? Was Koresh a manipulative psychopath who exploited an opportunity, as many FBI agents claim? Or was he just a deluded religious leader whose private play was suddenly exposed on the world stage? Perhaps we'll never know. Hostage negotiator Christopher Whitcomb, writing in Cold Zero, and true crime writer Clifford Leindecker in Massacre at Waco, Texas, both present a chronology of the facts on that momentous Sunday morning. Somewhere between 70 and 76 armed agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the ATF, prepared to move on a group of wooden buildings outside the central Texas town of Waco. Known as the Mount Carmel Center, the place was occupied by members of an apocalyptic religious group that was led by a man named David Koresh. Rumored to be stockpiled inside was an arsenal of explosives and weapons, some of which reportedly had been illegally converted to rapid-fire automatic that put them under ATF's jurisdiction. A UPS driver had tipped off the government when a package bound for Mount Carmel had broken open to reveal casings for hand grenades. While the group did earn money from gun sales and were legally allowed to trade in arms, it appeared that they weren't following protocol. Some neighbors also reported a lot of target practice. 
But there was more, too, that came out in the days ahead. Leindecker claims that the local newspaper was running a series of articles about Koresh's dubious activities entitled The Sinful Messiah, based on accounts by defectors like Mark Pro, who later authored Inside the Cult. Pro had hired detectives to snoop around, and when contacted by the ATF, he supplied a number of detailed descriptions of his former associates. He denounced Koresh, speaking of polygamy and other out-of-place practices involving children. Thanks to some of these leads, the ATF set up several agents to act as college students interested in Koresh's teachings. They moved into a house nearby and came over to visit. Catherine Wessinger, a religious scholar at La Loya University who penned How the Millennium Comes Violently, claims that they never fooled the Davidians. Then, that February 28th morning, a reporter asked for directions from a person who was connected to the Davidians, and that person alerted Koresh. At the time, one of the ATF agents was at Mount Carmel, and he left in a hurry. That behavior alerted Koresh, who was already aware that people had been asking questions about him. The agent who left called the ATF commander to let him know that the Davidians were aware of their approach. There was no more secrecy. In fact, there never really had been. Since reporters either accompanied the agents or arrived before them at the target area, clearly they'd been alerted. Leindecker, writing from the ATF's point of view, said that it seemed early enough in the day to the commanders that surprise was still on their side. Besides, it was Sunday, and the guns were supposedly locked up for the day of prayer. So the agents got into a convoy and drove out to the barren grounds to serve their warrants and seize any illegal items. A Black Hawk helicopter from the Texas National Guard accompanied them, along with two others belonging to the ATF. Everyone was aware of the potential risk. Koresh's paranoia about the government as the agent of Satan didn't help matters, because the ATF's advance only proved the truth of his prophecies. They would be attacked by the Babylonians. Even so, no one anticipated what actually happened. The agents hoped that this incident could be settled quickly. At nearly 10 o'clock, as three teams formed to enter the building, an agent went to the compound's front door and knocked. The first entry team was to be inside the front door within seven seconds after the convoy pulled up to the compound, says Leindecker. All the assault teams would be deployed within 13 seconds. They'd been preparing this for eight months, and each team had an assignment. Protect the children, neutralize the military force, and seize the arms. Koresh looked out from behind a steel door and learned that the agents had a search warrant. Instead of letting them in, he slammed the door, and then someone started shooting. It's not clear from which side the first bullets came, but both sides commenced a fierce gun battle. Wessinger says that the survivors of the skirmish and the subsequent standoff claim the bullets came in through the ceiling, which meant that agents in the helicopters were firing into the compound. The ATF, in several hearings afterward, says no one in the choppers fired a single shot. By some reports, agents were shooting the dogs to get them out of the way, and that's what started the deadly crossfire between the two groups. Women from inside who survived claim they'd placed their bodies over the children to protect them from the rain of bullets. Several agents were hit right away, and multiple shots came at the hovering choppers. One member of the team that penetrated the building was shot in the head and killed. Several who had climbed to the roof rolled off when hit. From noises inside, said agents in later hearings, it was clear that the cult had some heavy artillery. Bullets even pierced the reporters' cars, and then concussion grenades, known as flashbangs, exploded among the agents. Koresh and his crew appeared to have superior weapons. They also had the advantage of cover, while the agents were out in the open. Nevertheless, women were screaming inside and men were yelling. ATF bullets pierced the front door, behind which Koresh had been standing. Several people had been hit, including cultists firing from the tower, and four were wounded while five were dead. Whoever had started it, both sides knew they would have to fight hard for survival. The intense skirmish continued for around two hours before a truce was called, allowing the ATF to remove their dead and wounded. It turned out that 20 agents had been hit, but emergency facilities were 20 minutes away. The wounded were transported, but too late for four men, who'd sustained mortal wounds. 
Wessinger claims that the count was 20 wounded and 4 dead, but FBI records indicate that 16 were wounded and 4 were dead. While the ATF waited through a tense afternoon, they arranged to make some statements over a local radio station in the hope that Koresh was listening to let him know there would be no new attacks. Yet around 5 o'clock, when three cultists walking outside the compound to return there from work encountered ATF agents, the shooting resumed. Agents killed one and captured one of the trio, while one got away, and officials then broadcast a request to Koresh to give up without a fight. His response was a scripture reading. Wessinger interprets his behavior within her analysis of end times religious groups by pointing out that his ultimate concern was to obey God's will as revealed in the Bible in order to be included in the millennial kingdom. They had believed that day to be imminent and had armed themselves for its eventuality. Inside the buildings were over 100 people who believed in Koresh's divine gifts and his ability to dictate to them what God wished for them. Several apostates who were advising the ATF indicated that a siege could very well trigger a mass suicide like Jonestown. Nevertheless, ATF Director Stephen Higgins, as reported by Wessinger, had insisted two days before that a show of force against this group was necessary. Koresh quickly contacted the media and participated in several live interviews with CNN about how the ATF had endangered his flock. He emphasized the number of children who lived in the compound and said that he'd been shot and was bleeding badly. He expected to die. In fact, as Wessinger indicates, he probably interpreted this as another fulfillment of the prophecy of the lamb being mortally wounded. By that time, the ATF was reinforced, along with local police officers, Texas Rangers, members of the FBI's hostage rescue team, HRT, the FBI's special agent in charge, SAC, from the San Antonio office, a bomb squad, and several U.S. Marshals. The media, too, began to pour in. Koresh released four children ranging in age from three to six, and everyone settled in for a long night. Former Davidian Mark Bro provides a long history of the development of the Branch Davidians as an offshoot from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He also details how Koresh rose to power and eventually took over. In the beginning, his name was Vernon J. Howell, and he was a high school dropout with the gift of the gab. The Seventh-day Adventists advocated purity of the body as the temple in which the Holy Spirit resides, so their habits of eating and drinking were strict. They believed the final battle between good and evil could happen at any time, and when it did, only a select number would witness the return of Jesus Christ and be saved. Yet some members wanted regulations to be even stricter, and from the original church, several sects formed. Within this congregation during the early 1930s, Victor T. Hutef preached about the approaching apocalypse. He was chosen by God to cleanse the church, and when his defiant dogmatism forced him out, he took several followers with him. In 1935, they purchased land outside Waco, calling it Mount Carmel Center. Then, Hutef renamed his sect the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, and when he died in 1955, his wife Florence succeeded him as the leader. She gave a confident prediction for the exact date of the world's end in 1959, and many frightened converts flocked to Waco. When her prediction proved false, Benjamin Bowden then attracted a disillusioned group to himself. He called this group the Branch, which then became the Branch Davidians. When he died, his wife Lois became the new prophet, and among the more ambitious members of her group was Vernon J. Howell, who had joined in 1983. He was easygoing, handsome, and aggressive, with the flamboyance of a rock star. He could take any Bible verse and discuss it endlessly, which made him seem highly intelligent, even gifted, possibly inspired. Lois Bowden's son and heir, George, hated Howell. He intended to be the group's next leader, no matter how charming Howell might seem. There could only be one Messiah. As these two faced off, Howell charmed the elderly Lois into taking him as a lover. He claimed it was God's divine command that they produce a child together, although they failed in this. Eventually, the two men gathered their respective supporters, each claiming exclusive access to biblical revelation. Howell insisted that as God's seventh messenger, it was he who would set off the chain of events that would bring on the apocalypse. 
In some ways, he was right, at least for his own flock. When Lois died in 1986, Bowden forced Howell out. Howell left for a while, but then returned for a face-off. Bowden had dug up the corpse of an elderly woman to challenge Howell to raise her from the dead. So Howell tried to use this incident to get Bowden arrested. The sheriff needed proof, so Howell armed himself and took some men to enter Mount Carmel to get photographs. Bowden came at them with an Uzi, and they shot back. Surprisingly, no one was killed, but Bowden quickly went to prison on an unrelated charge, and that opened the door for Howell to take over. In a court trial, Bowden appeared to be more dangerous, especially when he had the corpse brought into the courtroom to prove his powers. Howell was acquitted of all charges, and he saw this as a sign of God's protection. Bowden left town and was later committed to a mental hospital. Now Howell was free to affirm himself as a harbinger of the Book of Revelations who could interpret the prophecies of the Seven Seals. When inspired one day by the new light, he divided husbands from wives and claimed all the women as his own. He gave each girl a Star of David, which Bro says was a symbol indicative of ownership. That cheap piece of jewelry signified that a female belonged to the exalted house of David and was destined to become a handmaiden to the Lord. The Lord, in this case, being Howell. It was important, Howell said, that as God, he had to spread his seed and create a divine army. Then he dubbed his male followers mighty men, the guards of King Solomon's bed, and they were to be his primary soldiers. It was estimated that he'd claimed at least 15 girls and women for his harem, some as young as 12. In 1990, Howell changed his name to David Koresh to bring together the concept that he was an heir to King David and that his name meant death. He dictated strict rules about how his flock should spend their days, apparently changing those rules at whim, and he preached at his flock day and night. Yet he himself was above the rules. He could eat food forbidden to them, sleep till noon, and drink alcohol. By 1992, Koresh was teaching his followers about martyrdom for the cause. At the same time, he was stockpiling food and collecting arms to defend himself against any attacks, whether from defectors or government agents, the Babylonians. While Wessinger claims that there's no evidence that the Branch Davidians were actually using the guns they were selling, they clearly had a siege mentality. The cult managed to acquire sufficient supplies, especially in terms of instant storable meals, to last a year if the need arose. According to defectors, Koresh demanded to know from members of his group how far they were willing to go in defense of the true faith. The only way to serve God was to be willing to die. He even taught the children that suicide might one day be required and showed them how to do it with cyanide or a gun. Eventually, he changed the name of Mount Carmel to Ranch Apocalypse. The first few days following the failed ATF raid, the government assembled a crisis management team to talk with the cornered Branch Davidians. In their report to the Deputy Attorney General on the events at Waco, Texas, compiled in October that year, the FBI described their crisis management program for handling situations like this. Acting quickly, they determined what resources would be needed and selected people for a team. That meant negotiators, tactical personnel, support people, local law enforcement, consultants, and liaisons with the media. Special Agent in Charge Jeffrey Jamar took over, raising the hackles of the ATF, who later said they had never asked for help. By 5 o'clock p.m. on the second day, the FBI had a full command center operating, which they had set up at a hangar at a former air base about a mile from the Branch Davidian compound. From the first day to the last, the place was abuzz with activity. The critical incident negotiation team supervised the negotiations. Using a team leader, an agent on the phone talking with someone inside the compound, secondary negotiators who handled that person's suggestions, and people to prepare the reports for the end of each day. These were kept in envelopes for anyone to read who might need information quickly. The initial communications had occurred between ATF special agents James Cavanaugh and David Koresh, but then Lieutenant Larry Lynch of the Waco Police Department took over, speaking mostly with Steve Schneider and Wayne Martin, Koresh's trusted lieutenants. Schneider was a disaffected Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, and Martin was an attorney. After the cult's messages to the media, 
the phone lines were rerouted from the compound so that anyone inside who dialed out would only get an FBI negotiator on the other end. During the second day, three negotiators kept up unceasing contact with 15 different members of Koresh's group, but that soon changed to contact with mostly Schneider or Koresh. Outside, the job of the hostage rescue team was to control the perimeter around the compound, for which they used different types of intimidating tanks. Christopher Whitcomb describes what it was like to be there, and he makes it clear that while the negotiators were trying to settle things peacefully, the HRT was ready for action. It was clear that the FBI's own people were working at odds with each other, and many of them knew it throughout the siege. Yet each side believed it was right. Negotiators insisted that tactical behavior only fulfilled Koresh's prophecy and strengthened his resolve. While the HRT people, with their pro-military mindset, believed that encroaching on his territory intimidated him and weakened him in the eyes of his flock, Koresh informed the FBI that he'd been hit by two bullets, one through the hip and one through his left wrist. He refused medical assistance. However, he did release 10 more children that day, including a baby. The FBI believed there was hope that he might eventually give up, although a psychological consultant was convinced that Koresh himself would never surrender. God was not going to prison. Then things got ugly. When Koresh realized he couldn't dial out to anyone except the FBI, he threatened more violence and hung out banners for requests for the media. Even so, he repeatedly assured anyone who asked that he had no plans for suicide. He promised to let everyone out if his message was played for the whole nation. As a show of good faith, he sent out a few more children. Also as a show of good faith, the FBI made arrangements for the broadcast on March 2nd, while U.S. Marshals prepared to take people into custody. Then they awaited the hour-long tape that Koresh was making. It arrived at 8 a.m., along with the release of two more children and two adults. As several Christian radio stations broadcast Koresh's speech, negotiators worked out the surrender logistics. Koresh was to come out first, carried on the stretcher. Then Schneider was to send someone out every two minutes. Vehicles were put in place to pick them up. That afternoon, Koresh assured negotiators that the plan was proceeding. He just wanted to lead his people in prayer. Then at six o'clock, he said that God had instructed him to wait. There would be no surrender that day. However, all he offered were Bible readings and statements of resistance. According to the FBI report, they learned that things were not as they seemed. Even as Koresh had denied ideas about suicide, he had actually formed a rather insidious plan. According to one of his own followers, Koresh believed he was about to die, so he'd instructed his group in what they were to do once he expired. They were to carry him outside on a stretcher and then fire on the agents so they would kill and then be killed. Some of them were given hand grenades and allegedly Koresh had instructed them to stand together in small groups and pull the pins. That way, they could take as many of the beast with them as possible. Everyone was to die. But then Koresh had a change of heart, perhaps because he was not dying after all. After talking about meeting in the next world, the Davidians gathered to pray and to wait for further instructions. Koresh then advised them that they should not emerge at that time because he had sinned by indulging in whiskey and prohibited food. That would effectively eliminate their salvation. The standoff continued. The next day, Koresh reiterated that his commands came from God and he sent out one child with nine puppies. Then he offered more scripture interpretations. He told the FBI that if his boss took it into his mind to punish them for what they had done, it would be the start of World War III. While the negotiators quickly grew bored of his endless hours of rambling speeches, they wanted to get as many children out as possible, so they listened patiently. Yet, then Koresh indicated that his own children would not be coming out. The FBI began to realize that this man was unpredictable. The negotiators consulted with several mental health experts and religious scholars, and there appeared to be little consensus, except that Koresh was likely to be dangerous if pushed too far. Since 1993, many scholars have tried to interpret the situation in retrospect, condemning the FBI for their lack of understanding. If only they'd been educated in biblical passages, Wessinger says, they would have known what Koresh was communicating. 
Jane Doherty, a professor of conflict resolution, writes that a study of these religious groups indicates that a propensity towards millennial beliefs appears to be imprinted on the human psyche. The roots of a violent encounter, such as that between the ATF and Branch Davidians, are inherently interactive. The group itself would probably not become violent without the catalyst of aggression or persecution. Such groups are easy targets for normal people to demonize. And as such, the setup tends to invite a clash. One psychiatrist, Park Dietz, who came to the command center early, read through all the reports and said that Koresh appeared to have antisocial and narcissistic traits, as well as paranoid and grandiose delusions. While some appeal to the rational side of his personality might work short-term, in the long run, his psychopathology would erupt. He would become dangerous. The best approach was to validate his ideas and get him to believe that his mission had not yet been accomplished. While he warned the FBI to be consistent, it became clear to negotiators that much of the ground they gained in discussions with Koresh was lost through bad judgment. Pete Smurik, a criminal investigative analyst, wrote a report to headquarters back in Virginia that the on-site commanders were moving too rapidly toward tactical deployment. He advised backing off with the tanks. The HRT was just making the situation more volatile. For years, Koresh had been brainwashing his followers in this battle between the church and the enemy, one memo read. On February 28th, his prophecy came true. Koresh is still able to convince his followers that the end is near, as he predicted. Their enemies will surround them and kill them. It wouldn't be effective to use a traditional hostage strategy in this situation. They weren't dealing with criminals, but with a religious fanatic whose followers would do whatever he said. Even worse than the show of force was the way the FBI seemed to be punishing every good act that Koresh did. When he sent people out, Jamar did things like turn off the electricity or broadcast raucous music. Koresh was clearly annoyed by all of this, and it was no wonder that he believed that God instructed him to resist rather than surrender. They were playing against his divinity, trying to weaken him, so he was reaching for all the symbols of his power. It was a no-win situation. Even so, after the 51 days that the siege ensued, the revolving teams of negotiators kept trying to resolve things peacefully and save the largest number of people possible. The behavioral science people were well aware that the HRT and other military-minded personnel viewed them as soft, but they knew their job. Hundreds of suggestions were faxed and mailed to them every day from people all over the country, and some experts even showed up. One man from a nearby university wrote a letter to Koresh that he expected the FBI to deliver. In it, he said that Koresh was misreading the scriptures, and he pointed out several divine directives that would indicate what God was really saying. Other people wanted to be allowed into the compound to argue the Bible with Koresh. They were well-meaning, but they failed to understand the kind of person Koresh was. They believed he could simply be reasoned into a different position and then give up. A few more aggressive people even threatened to force their way in, to either help Koresh or show him the error of his ways. In fact, on separate occasions, two men managed to accomplish this. They were welcomed inside to be proselytized, and they both left before the final days. A man claiming to be Jesus' brother arrived from Florida to talk with Koresh, and another claiming to be Jesus himself said that he had to go in and set Koresh straight on who Christ really was. One well-known minister claimed that Koresh was possessed by a demon and needed an exorcism, which he offered to perform. Many of these interventions amused the negotiators, but at the same time, they were well aware that fewer people were coming out and that Koresh could remain inside with his band for quite a long time, perhaps as long as a year. He had supplies stashed away, and water. The worst thing for his people was the cold nights without electricity, but so far, they were enduring that. They asked for milk for the children, which the FBI could hardly refuse. Trying to resolve things quickly, the negotiators tried to put together a strategy that relied on those things that Koresh most wanted. They knew he had won in court against Bowdoin and that he appeared to be enjoying all of the sudden fame, so they worked on that angle. The ATF had attacked. They could prove it from the crime scene. 
and Koresh could take them to court and win. He would then draw even more followers, and the Branch Davidians would be known all over the world. They were already on the cover of the major news magazines, and the world was watching. Koresh could parlay this into something beneficial for himself and his followers. Yet, even as they said these things to him, they were aware that he knew he had some other concerns, dead ATF agents, and charges of polygamy. He was likely aware that things would not go as easily as promised. Trying to get around Koresh, the FBI made tapes of the children who had come out, showing they were cared for, and urged them to appeal to their parents to join them. They sent these tapes into the compound, and each time they called the press together for a television broadcast, they turned the electricity back on so the Davidians could see what they were saying. The agents expressed concern for their safety and clarified inaccurate speculations. One other ploy was to record Koresh on the phone, and when his words seemed to undermine his preaching, they would broadcast that over loudspeaker for the rest of the cult to hear. It was hoped that at least some of them, in particular the key lieutenants, would see the inconsistency and question their leader. Yet, on March 9th, just over a week since the siege had begun, Koresh sent out a videotape on which he and Schneider had recorded interviews with people inside the compound. Each one expressed a firm desire to remain there. They were not coming out unless God ordered them to. Ultimately, Koresh was in control. He would decide when he'd negotiate and when he wouldn't. The FBI would have to sit there and wait. On March 12th, Davidian Kathy Schroeder came out. When questioned, she denied any plans for suicide, yet when she tried calling back into the compound, she received no answer. She did admit that some people inside wanted to come out, but were afraid of Koresh. They wouldn't leave until he told them to. That message was alarming. That meant that Koresh might well have a plan that exploited his group members' inability to act for themselves. At that point, Special Agent in Charge Jamar decided to shut off the electricity for good. Up until then, he'd allowed it to come on for short periods of time, but he was tired of all the dilly-dallying. This tactic angered everyone inside the compound and further annoyed the negotiators. Koresh rightly called it an act of bad faith, and Schneider said that the three people who'd been about to come out were now going to remain. A couple of days later, the tactical people placed bright lights outside the compound at night to make it difficult for those inside to sleep and stepped up the loud music as an annoyance. Wessinger lists the kind of music used as Tibetan Buddhist chants, bagpipes, seagulls crying, helicopters, dentist drills, sirens, dying rabbits, a train, and songs by Alice Cooper and Nancy Sinatra. A rock group actually offered to come in and play music that they knew would be psychologically demoralizing, but their offer was rejected. Then the HRT drained the compound's diesel storage tanks. More adults came out, and Caress said he would send out no one else. Then the loudspeaker system failed, much to Jamar's frustration and to the negotiators' relief, although they later got it working again. The crisis management team advised Jamar that since Koresh offered no specific time frame for surrender, the wait could be indefinite. At that point, the introduction of tear gas was mentioned. To avoid this, the negotiators made Koresh an offer. In prison, he could communicate with his followers and make a worldwide broadcast on CNN. In order to have these privileges, Koresh and his people had to leave by 10 o'clock the next day, March 23rd. Koresh rejected the deal and tore up the letter, and one more man emerged at this point. Schneider became more belligerent in his phone conversations, and many at the command center felt that something negative was building. On March 25th, the FBI sent in an ultimatum, send a minimum of 20 people out by the end of the afternoon, or they would begin to prepare for action. When no one emerged, the FBI removed motorcycles and other vehicles from in front of the compound. Two days later, According to FBI documents, Schneider denied Koresh's self-professed divinity and hinted that the FBI might burn the building to get them out. That seemed like a rather enigmatic comment, perhaps even a hint of what was being discussed inside. Then, several days were taken up with meetings between Koresh, Schneider, and two lawyers, one of whom had been hired by Koresh's mother. Once that was settled, Koresh decided that he wanted to spend Passover in the compound. Since he was the leader of a religious group, 
There was no real point in arguing. The FBI gave in and waited through the Passover period. As it neared an end, Koresh announced that he would observe it for seven more days. Passover was officially at an end, but who could argue? Once again, it was clear that he was in charge. By this time, it was clear to everyone that it was going to be one thing after another with him. He wrote and sent out several letters over the next few days that indicated he would never surrender or leave voluntarily. By April 10th, it appeared to be time to resume discussions about tear gas, and this time, the argument was presented to the newly sworn Attorney General Janet Reno. Having only recently taken up the reins, this was a difficult situation to be in. She asked for information about the gas, in particular, whether it was harmful to children. She was assured that it was not. The FBI wanted to use a substance called chlorobenzaladine malononitrile, or CS gas. They claim that it was not flammable, but other sources insist that it's highly flammable. Since the FBI did not expect flames to be present, they might have believed there was no real danger. However, inside the compound, to warm things up at night and to read, the group was using kerosene lamps. It seemed reasonable to expect that someone might have thought of that, yet clearly, no one did. Even as these discussions were underway, there were a few intermittent conversations with Koresh, who offered more of what they called Bible babble, and negotiations appeared to be stalled. Koresh was now saying that he needed time to write a manuscript on the meaning of the seven seals, and he was at work on that now. He asked for supplies to accomplish this, and the FBI sent those in. He completed it on April 16th, yet still he did not come out. Some of his followers who managed to get out said that he had only completed work on the first seal while the FBI believed he'd finished the entire manuscript and still resisted them. By that time, they'd had it. They no longer believed any of Koresh's promises. On April 17th, Reno approved of the use of CS gas to end the six-week standoff. Apparently, she felt that the negotiators had come to an impasse and that the sanitary conditions of the compound were deteriorating. She was thinking of the 23 children still inside. In addition to that, the operation was getting expensive, with no foreseeable end. Tear gas was uncomfortable, but it would not harm anyone. The HRT was instructed to insert it gradually over a period of 48 hours, and then be ready to capture people as they emerged. Arrest warrants were obtained for every person known to be inside, and search warrants for the compound were in hand. Teams prepared to wash gas off the children as they emerged, and to get them to safety. On April 18th, Tanks continued to remove vehicles from the front of the compound. Tension was high, and it was clear that Koresh was upset, especially when they moved his black Camaro. He called the command center and said, If you don't stop what you're doing, this could be the worst day in law enforcement history. A sniper with a good view of the compound reported that someone from inside had hung a sign on a window that read, Flames Await. It was an ominous message. The negotiators weren't sure what it meant, but they suspected that Koresh had a plan. They were soon to find out. Just after dawn on Monday morning, April 19th, the FBI phoned the compound to warn those inside about what was to occur. Leindecker provides a full description of what was said. It was not an assault, the FBI insisted, but a means of getting the Davidians to come out. This was the most uncomfortable tactic they'd used thus far, and if it didn't work, they could only resort to real aggression. Yet they believed that no one would long endure the harsh fumes of the gas. It burned the mouth, eyes, skin, and lungs to the point that any reasonable person would accept a way to escape it. Three minutes after the initial call, two combat engineering vehicles approached the buildings, punched holes into the fragile walls, and began to spray tear gas through nozzles into the compound, propelled by non-combustible carbon dioxide. Nearby were an Abrams tank and nine Bradley vehicles, while choppers flew overhead taking aerial photos. Everyone was under orders that if children were in any way endangered, the mission was to be aborted. Abruptly, the Davidians opened fire at the tanks, yet the tear gas injection continued and CS grenades were thrown in through the windows. The walls of the buildings were no match for the tanks, and large holes appeared wherever the tanks were used. Then the vehicles pulled back for an hour to reload and went at it again. The Davidians responded with more gunfire. 
They also tossed the telephone out the front door, a sign that all negotiations had ceased. Although survivors claimed that the tanks had broken the phone lines, at this point, if those who said they were using kerosene lamps were correct, and if the tanks had indeed knocked them over, the fires would already have started and spread. However, it would be several hours before that occurred, putting the claims into some doubt. The Texas wind was fierce that morning, which was not good for the tactical teams. The FBI continued to broadcast pleas for the Davidians to come out, hoping that at least the women with children would do so. They assured those inside that no one would be harmed, but the Davidians had already seen some of their fellow members led away in the days before in handcuffs and orange prison suits. This was yet another tactical error meant to display force. Then, just a few minutes after noon, the buildings quickly went up in flames and the fire spread fast. Agents close to the building heard gunfire, and they assumed that the people inside had decided to end it with a mass suicide. An HRT agent later claimed that he'd seen someone light a fire in front of the building, and several loud explosions inside erupted into a giant plume of black smoke that filled the sky. Helicopters flew back and forth, recording what they could, but no one knew how dangerous it might be to get close. Again, a message was broadcast over the loudspeaker that Koresh should send his people out. Only nine emerged. One woman who came out, her clothing in flames, tried to go back in, but was caught by an ATF agent and brought to safety. Firefighters arrived, but the FBI made them keep their distance due to gunfire and the possibility of more explosions. Around 1245, they entered the building and found numerous incinerated bodies. Most were well beyond immediate identification. The negotiators, who had worked long hours to ensure a peaceful resolution, were stunned. They had predicted something along these lines if aggression of any kind were used. Even so, they had not imagined the magnitude of what did happen. And now it was time to investigate the crime scene. For that, another team was called into action, and those agents whose work was done went home. They were aware there would be endless inquiries about how such an event could have occurred. By the end of that shocking day, 80 people were found dead, 23 of them under 17. Koresh had fathered 14 of them. While rumors spread that Koresh himself had escaped through underground tunnels, his body was later identified by dental records. He'd been shot in the head. Many of the victims had died from gunshot wounds. Over 100 firearms were eventually recovered from the scene and 400,000 rounds of ammunition. Wessinger states that many of them were still in their plastic wrappers, apparently scheduled for shipment rather than for use, but that's an interpretation without evidence. It wasn't long before accusations were flung from both sides that the other side had started the fire, and the FBI brought to court what they felt was clear evidence that the Davidians had done it. They produced surveillance audio tapes of people inside the compound joking the day before about catching on fire. On the actual day, there were recorded commands to spread the fuel and light the torch. Yet survivors who had escaped the compound claimed there had never been a suicide plan. Still, they could not explain why Koresh refused to come out for six hours after the introduction of tear gas. The subsequent investigation showed that the fire had three points of origin, which would not have happened accidentally. One canister that had incendiary potential and that matched what the FBI was using was actually found in water, so it could not have started a fire. Yet if it was true that CS gas was flammable, then the amount pumped into the compound could easily have caught fire. The question was, what was the true source of the fire? Had the tanks knocked over oil lamps? If so, why hadn't the fire begun earlier? No one seemed to have satisfactory answers, but everyone pointed the finger, including people who were not even there. Nevertheless, it was no doubt that the initiating ATF raid was ill-planned and completely unnecessary. Koresh could have been arrested peacefully away from the compound while a search was activated. Even if the ATF firmly believed that only an element of surprise would have allowed the plan to succeed, once that surprise was lost, they should have stopped and prepared for something else. There was little evidence of awareness of what the Davidians were all about, and it was clear that a paramilitary maneuver simply to inspect some guns was overkill. In a videotape for the History Channel, entitled Cults, 
journalist Mike Wallace sternly points out that there were many people to blame for what happened to the Branch Davidians inside the compound, not just them, and there might never be complete clarity on the issue. The ATF made another suspicious decision as well. On May 12th, less than a month after the incident, they bulldozed the site. In other words, if there were any clues remaining after the fire that might have provided information as to what took place, they were now beyond use. Most Americans afterward blamed the Branch Davidians for what had taken place. But in later years, the sentiment shifted somewhat, and some homegrown radicals decided there should be some payback. Only two years later, on the anniversary of the fire, Timothy McVeigh left a truck full of explosives outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing or injuring hundreds of workers and their children. Those who view the government the way Koresh did are unlikely to accept any explanation but one, unwarranted government persecution. David Koresh had decided that the fifth seal of Chapter 6 in the Book of Revelation predicted that Armageddon would occur there at Mount Carmel. It describes those who were slain for the word of the Lord and mentions a waiting period, after which the entire community would be killed. According to Koresh's understanding, through this violence, he and his people were to achieve salvation. While there were predictions from religious and political scholars that another Waco was in the making among other secretive groups, the FBI did learn from the incident. The next time they were faced with a similar standoff, the Freeman in Garfield County, Montana, in 1996, they approached it much differently. From March 25th to June 13th, the FBI confronted a small group of Christian patriots who called themselves the Freeman. Their aim was to overthrow the government, which they viewed as satanic. As part of a protest, some of them stopped paying taxes and government loans, which resulted in the foreclosure of their property. Instead of leaving, they tried setting up their own local government and threatened to arrest, even to hang, local government officials. This brought in the FBI, but with restrictions from Attorney General Reno that there would be no armed confrontation. The freemen that gathered on a foreclosed wheat farm were armed, but the federal agents relied on more than 40 negotiators, including family members of the protesters, to try to bring about a peaceful resolution. No one wanted another Waco. Those on the farm were offered conditions that allowed them to remain loyal to their concerns and to run their own defense, even as 14 of them were taken into custody. In other words, contrary to Waco, the FBI avoided acting in a way that confirmed the group's persecutory belief system, and the matter ended in the courtroom for issues of tax evasion, rather than on an impromptu battlefield. About 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, March 13, 1977, John LeMay, 17, told his next-door neighbor that he was going to Redondo Beach to see a guy he'd met at a gym in downtown Los Angeles, whose name was Dave. When John didn't come home that night or the next day, his hysterical mother called the El Segundo police, certain that something had happened to him, claiming that her son didn't just go off for days at a time. Police chalked it up as another teen runaway. On March 18th, the remains of John LeMay, who was homosexual, were discovered beside a highway south of Corona. He had been carefully dismembered, all the body parts washed and drained of blood, and neatly packed into five industrial trash bags. Each bag was carefully sealed with nylon filament tape, and three of the bags had been crammed into an empty 80-gallon oil drum, the other two left on the ground next to it. The boy's head was missing, but a birthmark clearly identified the remains as belonging to John LeMay. The decade of the 70s was a confusing time for young people, particularly young gay people. The AIDS epidemic hadn't been named as a serious threat yet. The popularity of gay bathhouses, gay bars, and anonymous sex in parks, public toilets, and parties was at its frenzied zenith. Gays were coming out with a vengeance, and they were finally taking what they considered their rightful freedoms. In the wake of the free love 60s in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury, young people headed to California in droves. Gay teens were drawn there as if to Mecca. Misunderstood youths ran away from unsympathetic parents, stuck out their thumbs, and headed to their promised land. They didn't necessarily find what they were looking for. Many of them ended up as boy prostitutes, trying to eke out a meager living. During the 70s and early 80s, 
More than 100 young hitchhikers caught rides on the streets and freeways of Southern California and didn't live to tell about it. They were young, pretty, and eventually desperate. According to Berkeley psychologist Michael Evans, homosexuals are an easy population to get access to in some anonymous way. Chicago Police Sergeant Richard Sandberg put it another way. The gays are easy prey. Hitchhiking has never been a safe mode of transportation, but in the 1970s, getting into a car with a stranger was a horrifyingly common occurrence. Predators cruised the freeway on-ramps and beach highways. They frequented bars, hoping to find young boys in an agreeable state of inebriation. Sometimes they were looking for money, sometimes for quick, impersonal sex. Sometimes they wanted to vent their frustrations and rage on someone, anyone unsuspecting. While homosexuals constitute only about 5% of serial killers, they're more prone to overkill than their straight counterparts, indulging in the more horrific extremes of torture, mutilation, and dismemberment. Gay men are also among the most prolific of serial killers. The sheer promiscuity of their crimes is a kind of grotesque mirror of the free-ranging sexual lifestyle embraced by so many gay men in the pre-AIDS era of the 1970s. Why homosexual serial killers as a group should be especially sadistic is an interesting question, although one element is surely the prevailing homophobia of American society, which causes many gay men to grow up with a deep-seated sense of self-hatred, a violent homophobia of their own. When these feelings are combined with the psychopathology of a serial killer, the results can be particularly appalling. The FBI estimates that somewhere between 10 and 50 serial killers are still at large in America. Patrick Wayne Kearney was born in Texas in 1940, the youngest of three boys. He was thin, shy, prone to illness, and an easy target for schoolyard bullies. By the time he was eight years old, he knew he would kill people. By the time he was a much-ridiculed teen, he was actively fantasizing about murder. His fantasies were very detailed. And then he tried it. It started in the mid-60s in Tijuana and San Diego. He picked up guys in bars, bus stops, and places where gay men congregated, looking for a quickie in the bushes. They were easy to find, easy to kill, bodies easy to dispose of in the desert. But in his public life, Kearney appeared normal. He put his time in with the army as well as into a short marriage. Neither of those situations suited him. In 1962, Kearney met David Douglas Hill. Hill was married and an army veteran. A six-foot-two high school dropout from Lubbock, Hill joined the army in 1960 but was quickly discharged on a diagnosis of an unspecified personality disorder. Back in Lubbock, he married his high school sweetheart, but, like Kearney's trial marriage, Hill's was short-lived. When he met Kearney, Hill divorced his wife and moved to California with Kearney in 1967. Patrick got a good job as an aeronautics engineer with Hughes Aircraft, and David stayed home. But though it was love at first sight when they met, their 10-year life together was tumultuous and stormy. Frequently, Hill would stomp out of the house and go spend a few nights with some friends. Or he'd pick up a one-night stand out of frustration and revenge. Occasionally, he went all the way home to Lubbock, but he always returned. When Hill was gone, Kearney's impotent frustrations reached a boiling point. There was only one thing he knew that would satisfy those feelings of repressed rage. When Hill left the house after a fight, Kearney would go prowling. He'd jump in his Volkswagen and go out to pick up hitchhikers or young men from gay bars. Being of slight build, he had a surefire system of subduing his victims. He shot them in the head with a 22 caliber pistol without warning. Sometimes he'd be driving down the highway, paying strict attention to the speed limit with his left hand on the steering wheel, then shoot his victim in the passenger seat with his right. Then he'd drive around until he found a suitably private place for him to relieve his frustrations, vent his rage, and wield his power. As soon as he was alone with their corpses, he would undress them and have sex with them. Then he would employ the hacksaw and cut them into pieces. If he was at home, he did this in the bathroom, fastidiously washing each body part and draining it of blood to keep it from smelling. He left no fingerprints in the dried blood. He learned all this from carefully reading the notorious crimes of Dean Coral, who murdered 17 young boys in Houston, wrapped them up in trash bags, and buried them. 
Kearney studied Coral's heinous crimes and collected newspaper clippings as news of his torture and murder spree came to a violent conclusion when one of his vicious accomplices killed Coral with his own gun. Most of Kearney's victims reminded him of the type of person who had given him a bad time during his teenage years, blonde and arrogant. Sometimes, after he'd kill them and had sex with their corpses, he would beat them. Patrick Kearney wasn't the only one killing young people in Southern California during this time. The Hillside Stranglers, Angelo Buono and his equally psychotic cousin, Kenneth Bianchi, were plying their trade in the same area at the same time, abducting young girls, torturing them, strangling them, and dumping their bodies wherever convenient. Zodiac Killer was on the loose, taunting police and reigning terror with his random murders. The zebra killers were randomly hacking people to death with machetes in San Francisco. And, closer to home, Randy Kraft was proving to be one of the all-time most demented killers of gays, with his incomprehensible sadistic torture methods. William Bonin, with his sidekick Vernon Butts, was also committing horribly grisly murders on young gay men and discarding the remains alongside the freeways. No wonder the police were confused. They didn't know how many serial killers they had, and they didn't know how many of them were copycat murders. But, as the body count rose, they noticed some marked differences in the modus operandi. One murderer, later to be identified as Randy Kraft, routinely picked up hitchhikers, gays, marines, or whoever caught his fancy. He then drugged them, tortured them for hours, and ended up by castrating them and shoving whatever was handy, a broom handle, a tree branch, a pole, the victim's own genitals or underwear, into their rectums. He usually did this while the victim was still alive and screaming. William Bonin strangled his victims with rope, cord, or the victim's t-shirt before ripping the corpses and throwing the bodies to the side of the road. But one killer stood out from the others by carefully dismembering his victims, cleaning them up, and tidily bagging them. The press called these the trash bag murders. The homicide cops called them the f***ing bag murders. Some experts claim that serial killing is an addiction. Once they begin killing, and sometimes they kill the first time by accident, serial killers find themselves addicted to murder in an intense cycle that begins with homicidal sexual fantasies that in turn spark a desperate search for crimes, leading to a brutal killing, followed by a period of cooling off and a return to a normal daily routine, with all its unbearable stresses, disappointments, and hurts, which lead back to the re-emerging need to start fantasizing about killing again. Once a killing cycle is triggered, it is rarely broken. With time, trapped in this addiction cycle, serial killers become more frenzied, and the frequency and violence of their murders escalate exponentially until they're either caught or burn out. The killer reaches a point where killing no longer satisfies them, and they stop on their own accord if nothing else interrupts their killing career. Some commit suicide, move on to commit other crimes, or turn themselves into the police. A study of 326 U.S. male serial killers between 1800 and 1995 concluded that 87% had killed at least one stranger and 70% killed only strangers. The most prolific serial killers also tend to be the most organized. They methodically stalk their victims for the best opportunity to strike so as not to be seen, and they smartly dump the bodies far away so as not to leave any clues. Although anyone can be targeted, victims of serial killers tend to be the most vulnerable in society, children, prostitutes, and the elderly. But the most striking and intriguing aspect of serial murderers is the nature of their motivation to satisfy an intense appetite for power and sadism. The serial murderer tends to kill not for love, money, or revenge, but just for the fun of it, because it makes him feel good. Because John LeMay told his neighbor that he was going to visit someone named Dave in Redondo Beach, police equated that name with a name that regularly appeared in the sign-in sheets at the gay bathhouses, and soon was knocking on the door of the modest Kearney Hill home in Redondo. Kearney and Hill welcomed them in and seemed to be relaxed, concerned about the missing boy, and totally innocent. While there, though, investigators helped themselves to a few carpet fibers, because for the first time in a trash bag murder, carpet fibers had been caught up in the nylon filament tape used to seal the bags. The fibers matched. As soon as the police left, Kearney destroyed all the files he'd kept on Dean Coral. 
the police came back and asked for samples of both Kearney's and Hill's pubic hair, as well as hairs from their dog. The pair cooperated fully. All the fibers in hair matched evidence left on LeMay's body. But when the cops came back again, this time with a search warrant, the couple was gone. Police found a hacksaw with a fresh, clean blade, but little bits of blood and tissue were caught up in the corners. John LeMay's blood and tissue. They found residual blood all over the bathroom, invisible to the naked eye, but clearly there under forensic examination. They found familiar nylon filament tape and a search of Kearney's office at Hughes Aircraft offered up a source of the exact same trash bags used in what was looking like upward of 20 murders. A good public relations campaign can be hard for a criminal to outrun. Most notably, victims' families use public relations as a tool to ferret out information from the public and to keep pressure on the investigative bodies. Tearful press conferences, like those the families of Lacey Peterson, Natalie Holloway and Brooke Wilberger held, keep the story in the public eye and keep the local police on their toes. Amber Alerts and the America's Most Wanted television show turn citizens into amateur sleuths. Rewards, like those posted by families or by Oprah Winfrey, tend to capture the attention of the viewing public, an outgrowth of which is a better informed citizenry and fewer places for a fugitive to hide. The Hillside Strangler Investigation Task Force was construed as a public relations vehicle. The Los Angeles Police Department, going through the usual high-profile motions to reassure the public, set up a special task force which included the investigating officers from the Glendale Police Department and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Not that they had anything new to go on, but all the busy commotion and news conferences looked good on television. The pressure was on Kearney and Hill, too, with their photographs posted on posters. When the heat was clearly on, Kearney and Hill flew to El Paso, Texas, but knew that life on the lam was not for them. The cops knew who they were and what they looked like. At the behest of relatives, the pair returned to California and at 1.30 p.m. on July 1, 1977, walked into Riverside County Sheriff's Office, pointed at a wanted poster with their pictures on it, and said, We're them. They were booked on suspicion of two murders and had been wanted for questioning in connection with six other slayings. They were arraigned on the two murder charges. Bail was set at $500,000 each. Kearney cooperated fully with the police. He said the murders excited him and gave him a feeling of dominance. The idea of hurting and killing someone sounded sexually exciting. When officers grilled him about picking up Marines and feeding pills and booze to his victims, they got a blank look from him. They persisted, wanting to know if he had ever put anything but his penis into his victims' rectums. He used towels to keep the bodies from leaking all over his bathroom before he dismembered them, Kearney told them. The police persisted, hoping to put to rest more of their freeway mysteries. How about torture? Did he ram anything into an anus for the sheer pleasure of it? Recognition crossed Kearney's face and he shook his head. I am not the wooden stake, he said. He knew exactly what the detectives were getting at, but impaling, strangling and torturing his victims wasn't his style. A bullet to the head was clean and simple. He seemed offended that he would be confused with Randy Kraft. The trash bag murders investigation began officially on April 13, 1975, when the body of Albert Rivera, 21, of Los Angeles, was found near Highway 74, east of San Juan Capistrano, in a heavy-duty trash bag. But according to Kearney, in a series of letters, confessions, and conversations with the police, the killing began much earlier, in the mid-60s in Tijuana and San Diego. He led them to the site where he had buried one of his first victims, known only as George, behind his and Hill's Culver City apartment. The victim was killed around Christmas 1968. The police dug where Kearney indicated and came up with a skeleton with a single bullet hole in its skull. After killing George, a paranoid Kearney laid low for over a year. Nobody came knocking on his door, and he realized that he had actually gotten away with murder. A neighbor said he occasionally heard what she thought were gunshots, but had no idea they came from the Kearney and Hill apartment. After his arrest, Kearney wrote letters to the police, detailing the crimes, the names of the victims, and the places the bodies could be found. An 18th count of murder was filed the same day that the 13th Hillside Strangler victim was found. As to John LeMay, Hill wasn't home when his young lover came to the house. 
so Kearney invited him in to watch television. Without provocation, Kearney shot LeMay in the back of the head and later dumped his remains in the desert. He liked using the desert. The desert animals and insects removed evidence quickly and efficiently. Things disappear very rapidly in the desert, he told investigators. You can put a small animal on an anthill and it disappears right in front of your eyes. Kearney once had a flat tire during one of his drives to the desert to dispose of a body. When he discovered that the spare was flat too, he had to call a tow truck to get his car to a service station. Kearney stood by, sweating bullets while the attendant fixed the flat, never questioning the bags in the back seat, which contained arms, legs, a rib cage, and some intestines. Another time, he locked his keys in the car while inspecting possible dump sites. It took him hours to jimmy open the lock with a coat hanger, nervously looking over his shoulder the whole time, freshly filled trash bags again in the back seat. As soon as the bags were unloaded, though, he felt an enormous sense of relief, accomplishment, and power. After hearing three hours of evidence, the Riverside County Grand Jury refused to indict David Hill. Public defender Malcolm McMillan spirited him out of jail under a cloak of secrecy to protect him from reporters and photographers. Hill fled California and returned to Lubbock. Riverside District Attorney Byron Morton said, The evidence against Mr. Hill was weak, adding that much of the information unearthed by Riverside investigators tended to exonerate Hill. McMillan said he was not surprised the grand jury refused to indict Hill, adding that he didn't think there was sufficient evidence to hold him to answer in superior court. Kearney said that Hill was neither involved in nor aware of the murders. He said that he committed all the murders while Hill was away. Did Kearney take all the blame to free an innocent man or to absolve his lover? Is it likely that Hill was innocent? Against the advice of his attorney, Patrick Kearney changed his not guilty plea to a plea of guilty. His attorney advised him to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, but Kearney pleaded guilty to the original three charges of murder and asked to be sentenced immediately in an apparent move to avoid California's death penalty. His actions were moot. The death penalty law didn't go into effect until August 1977. All of Kearney's homicides predated that time, so the death penalty was never an option for prosecutors. Superior Judge John Hughes handed down a life term with the possibility of parole in seven years. Judge Breckenridge said, This defendant has certainly perpetrated a series of ghastly and grisly crimes. I can only hope the Community Release Board will never release Mr. Kearney. He appears to be an insult to humanity. For what seems to be approximately 32 murders, Kearney was eventually charged with 21 counts of murder and received 21 life sentences. If all of his confessions are truthful, he also murdered two children, ages five and eight, along with four victims whose bodies were never recovered. At least seven of his victims remain unidentified. Patrick Kearney is today living out his life sentences in California. He writes essays and has a few of them published. The trash bag murders are considered among the most heinous crimes of the 20th century. Patrick Kearney's swath of death ranks him with the likes of Jerry Brudos, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy. If he hadn't gotten sloppy, consciously or unconsciously, he'd probably still be doing it today. In the suburb of Melbourne, Australia, known as Frankston, during a span of weeks in the summer of 1993, two teenage girls and a young adult woman lost their lives at the hands of a violent serial killer, and another middle-aged woman was attacked but managed to survive. Since none of the victims were linked to one another, except for their location, which was less than an hour from Melbourne, in southeastern Victoria, the crimes were not initially connected for certain, but eventually police highly suspected they were in pursuit of a single serial killer in these cases, who was in the habit of choosing victims randomly and stabbing them to death. The community would soon find out that the killer was someone who had lived among them for a while, a 21-year-old man named Paul Charles Denyer. At six feet tall, and being overweight as well, he definitely looked like an imposing force, but it was his complete lack of emotion when arrested that revealed how devoid of humanity he really was. While some have described Denyer as resembling Canadian actor John Candy, who was famous for his role in numerous comedies such as Planes, Trails and Automobiles, The Blues Brothers, Uncle Buck and Cool Runnings, 
and 40 other films, the similarities stopped at the physical level. Denyer was no animal lover, nor a family man, as his celebrity look-alike had been. In fact, Denyer's history involves the same telltale signs as many other serial killers, animal abuse being prominent in his childhood. As for movies, Denyer much preferred those centered around blood and gore rather than comedy, supposedly watching and re-watching many times films like The Stepfather, Halloween, and Fear. He admitted to the police that he had had the urge to kill for the better part of his adolescence, claiming since just 14 years of age, I've always wanted to kill, waiting for the right time, waiting for that silent alarm to trigger me off. This culminated seven years later. Born to British parents who had immigrated to Australia in 1965, Paul Charles Denyer arrived into this world on April 14, 1972, in Sydney. Maureen and Anthony Denyer had two older boys at the time and would have another boy and a girl after Paul. As an infant, Paul was said to have taken a fall off a bench, bumping his head. And so there was a running family joke blaming anything Paul did that was out of the ordinary on the incident. While that teasing occurred at home, in school, Denyer at first struggled to socialize with others in kindergarten, even though he seemed to adjust by the end of the year. Even so, the family's move in 1981 was not an easy adjustment for Denyer. The move had been brought about by Anthony Denyer's work. He was taking a management position at the stake place on Centre Road in South Oakley, which was on the Frankston train line. While all of the Denyer children had a hard time leaving Campbellton, Paul Denyer was said to be a completely different child at his new school, Northvale Primary. He was described as a loner, as lacking self-confidence, and as being unmotivated in his studies. His physical characteristics didn't help Denyer blend in much either. He was noticeably tall and also much heavier than other kids. His interests also put him at odds with the norm, collecting knives and homemade slingshots, as well as clubs. Using a homemade knife, Denyer slit the throats of his sister's teddy bears. As if destroying his siblings' toys were not disturbing enough, he moved on a ten to stab and slit the throat of the family's kitten with his brother's pocket knife proceeding to hang it then from a tree in their backyard. Later on, it came about that Denyer had also treated a friend's cat in a similar manner, slaughtering it, and then he slit the throats of its kittens, multiple counts of animal cruelty. He even allegedly slaughtered and dismembered two goats in a paddock next door to his last place of employment, a marine workshop. He was fired, though, as his employer felt he didn't spend much time working and instead poured his time into a hobby of making knives at the job site. Other crimes started piling up on Denyer's record as he entered his teens, including car theft, although he was only given a warning for that. Just a couple of months later, he was charged with a false report of a fire, theft, and willful damage. He was in trouble again and again. The crimes became more specifically violent against humans, and at age 15, he was charged with assault when he coerced another boy to masturbate publicly. He even lost employment due to his treatment of people, having allegedly assaulted a woman and child with a line of shopping trolleys at Safeway Supermarket. Safeway did open a different chapter in Denyer's life, though, as he met Sharon Johnson while at work there in 1992. This would have been as close to a normal relationship as he would ever have. Other jobs never gave him a chance, such as the time he applied to the Victorian police force. Perhaps fortunately, he was rejected, citing his being unfit physically. Unable to hold down a job only added to the signs of being a social outcast, and he continued to be obsessed with death, horror murder movies, and in general, anything macabre. During all of this, Denyer moved in with Sharon Johnson, who lived in a flat on Denanong Road in Frankston. Denyer was jobless and had a great deal of unfocused time on his hands, while Sharon was working two jobs to keep up with the bills. Not too long after Denyer moved into the flat, disturbing things started happening in the area. A burglary occurred in one flat, and all of that tenant's engagement photos and clothes had been slashed with a knife. There were also accusations of a peeping Tom by another tenant. Meanwhile, Denyer and Johnson had become friends with yet another tenant, Trisha, who had a sister named Donna. Donna didn't live on the same block, but close enough by, with her newborn baby and her fiancé, Les who worked delivering pizzas late into the night. One evening, 
Donna experienced a series of unnerving prank calls and joined Les with the baby out for a while. Upon all arriving back to their home for the night after Les's work was complete, they were met with quite a horrific scene. On the wall next to their television was a message that appeared to be written in blood, Dead Dawn, and a second message that read, Donna, you're dead. Scattered along the floor across the living room and kitchen were the entrails of Donna's cats, Buffy. Blood was everywhere. Draped over the bulk of the cat's disemboweled body was a picture of a bikini-clad woman. Oddly, one of Buffy's eyes was bulging from its socket, while the other eye was missing completely. In a hauntingly similar manner to another portion of the story, Buffy's kittens were not spared. In the bathroom, the two kittens, their throats cut, were lying in the baby's bath, which was full of bloodied water. No room untouched, there was even blood everywhere in the laundry room, sprayed all up the walls and even a freshly laundered basket full of baby clothes. In another area, the baby's clothing had been slashed and destroyed as well. The flat itself had damages beyond the remains of the cat. In the kitchen, cupboard doors bore splintered holes where someone had kicked them in. The intruder had opened every drawer and clothes were ripped and strewn all throughout the bedroom. A collection of centerfold pinups that Les had kept had been slashed and stabbed with some sort of a knife. Another photo of a semi-clad model was found at the baby's crib. The words, Donna and Robin, had been sprayed in white shaving foam on the dressing table mirror. Who Robin was remained a mystery. As one might imagine, Donna couldn't bring herself to stay at the flat ever again after that night in February 1993, so she opted to stay temporarily with her sister, Trisha, until she found another place. Paul Denyer, who knew Donna quite well through Trisha, had the gall to tell Donna that she would be safe now, even going as far to say that if the police found out who was responsible, that he would make it his mission to take care of them for her. Just a few months later, a series of events unfolded that tied everything together. In June, Elizabeth Stevens, an 18-year-old student, was reported by her aunt and uncle as missing. She had been staying with them but didn't return in the evening they reported her. Unfortunately, her body was recovered in Lloyd Park, just a short drive from Frankston, on Cranbourne Road in Langwarren the next day, Saturday, June 12, 1993. Her injuries were numerous. Six deep knife wounds had penetrated her chest, four cuts ran from her breast through her abdomen, and four ran across to form a crisscross pattern of squares. Her face had suffered cuts and abrasions, and her throat had been cut. Her nose appeared to have been broken. Although her bra was found around her neck, a post-mortem exam indicated no sexual intercourse had occurred. As Elizabeth had no known involvement with anyone who would have been violent, her murder was suspected to be at random. As police went to great lengths to find the killer, they spared no resources, even going so far as to display a life-size mannequin at a roadblock near the bus stop where the teenager had last been seen, hoping that new details would be brought forward in the case and therefore new leads. Bus drivers and passengers were questioned. All of the residents in the district were as well. Even the local libraries were investigated, but no one seemed to know anything more. Then in July, on the 8th, a 41-year-old named Rosa Toth, who worked as a bank clerk, was violently attacked on her way home from Seaford in the Frankston district. Her attacker claimed to have a gun and attempted to force her into the cover of the woods. Mrs. Toth fought off her attacker. Despite him ripping hair from her head, she bit his hands and continued fighting back until he gave up and ran away, at which point she emerged with torn stockings and no pants at a roadway where she caught the attention of a car that was approaching. She escaped with her life that night, and police assumed it was a purse snatching gone wrong. That same night, a 22-year-old woman was preparing dinner when she realized she was out of milk. She drove to the store in Seaford, but went missing during the trip. She was the mother of a newborn, Jake who was just 12 days old, and her name was Debbie Freem. It wasn't until the 12th, four days later, that her body was found by a local farmer in Carum Downs. Debbie Freem had been stabbed a total of 24 times along her chest, neck, head and arms, and also was strangled. But, like the first victim, she had not been sexually violated. The police began to link both of these stabbings and the attack on Rosa Toth, looking for just one suspect for all three of these crimes. To deal with the fear in the community, a help center, called Operation Reassurance, 
was created to be a resource for women regarding how to prevent attacks and what to do if one was attacked. Even so, one more teenager would lose her life before the killer was stopped. On July 30th, Natalie Russell, who was 17 years old, was riding back to her house from John Paul College on her bike in Frankston. It was the middle of the afternoon when she disappeared. That night, her remains were found in some bushes between the peninsula and the Long Island golf clubs. Her slain body bore multiple stab wounds around her face and neck, her throat was slashed, and yet there was no proof of sexual intercourse, just as in the cases of the other two murdered women. There was something new in this case, though. A piece of evidence that would become key was left on the body. A small piece of skin, thought to be from a finger, was removed from the neck of the victim that had belonged to her killer. Also, a sighting by a reliable source, a police officer no less, had occurred that seemed to be related. At about 3 p.m., someone had seen a Toyota Corona that was memorably yellow and near the bike track. This was about the time the coroner thought the murder of Natalie Russell had taken place. The officer had written down the registration number after determining the car had no plates and so was suspect. Running the registration number gave the police a match with a report from a postal worker. The man had been sitting suspiciously in the front seat, slumping as if he didn't want to be seen, and something about it had bothered the postal worker. That wasn't much, but it also came up that this was a match to a car seen in the area where Debbie Freem's body was discovered. And that was no random circumstance. The registration indeed belonged to Paul Charles Denyer. Denyer wasn't home, though, when the police showed up at his apartment at 3.30 p.m. that day. Detective Mick Hughes and Charlie Bezina slipped a card under the door and requested contact, hoping to hear something later. Sharon Johnson was the one who called them back at 5.15 p.m., and they reassured her it was just part of the canvassing of the neighborhood, a routine inquiry. They didn't want to scare Denyer off before they could find him and quickly proceeded to put together a team. Within 10 minutes, the group, headed by Mick Hughes, Rod Wilson, and CIB detective Darren O'Loughlin, were at the scene of the flats at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road, ready to take Denyer. When they knocked, Denyer seemed rather calm and collected, and had an answer for most of the questions they asked him. Why was he driving a car with no plates? Well, he actually had a 28-day permit to do so while he made the repairs it needed before it could be registered. Why had his car been seen in the areas of each crime scene during the time frames of the murders? He claimed his car had broken down near the bike trail, which was the area where Natalie Russell had been found, and that he had been picking up Sharon near the train when his car had been spotted the other time. What didn't match up were all of the cuts and even the missing skin on his hands. He had an answer for that, too, tying it back to the car repairs and saying that he'd gotten injured while working on the fan in the car engine. Denyer denied knowing anything about the murders at all, except for what he'd learned from the news. But the detectives saw through all of the excuses and numerous coincidences. They proceeded to take him into the police station for questioning. In the interrogation room, they requested hair and blood samples for a DNA test. All throughout the night, he had maintained his innocence, but the realization of the implications of a DNA match changed the game for him. He asked how long the results would be before they returned. He wanted to know if they had a sample from the victims that purportedly had come from the killer. Out of nowhere, he suddenly and spontaneously admitted, Okay, I killed all three of them. Detective Darren O'Loughlin's interrogation was finally getting somewhere. It was now the early morning hours of August 1st, and Denyer began to reveal the details of his murders of Elizabeth Stevens, Debbie Freem, and Natalie Russell, as well as Rosa Toth's attack. In a detached, completely unremorseful, and almost smug manner, Denyer delivered his confession as one who was describing a job process to a group of new employees or recounting his day to an acquaintance, but certainly not like one who was describing violent acts. The sense of control he appeared to feel was something he immensely enjoyed. He was the only one who had information that they were after, and he knew it. As for Elizabeth Stevens' murder, he confirmed that it was at random. He described it as being a rainy, gloomy night, and she had gotten off the bus around 7 p.m. at the stop on Cranbourne Road in Langwarren. He was waiting around the bus stop, saw her, and decided to follow her. While it would have only been a short walk until she was back at the safety of her aunt and uncles, instead she found herself being grabbed from behind and told that she would be finished off if she screamed or tried to run. 
Denyer used a piece of aluminum pipe to feign having a gun held on his victim and persuaded her to go into the woods at Lloyd Park. His account included that they walked into a bit of bushland beside the main track in Lloyd Park, sat there, you know, stood in the bushes for a while, just, I can't remember, just standing there, I suppose. I held the gun to the back of her neck, walked across the track over towards the other small sand hill or something, and on the other side of that hill, she asked me if she could, you know, go to the toilet, so to speak. So I respected her privacy. So I turned around and everything while she did it and everything. When she finished, we just walked down toward where the goalposts are, and we turned right and headed toward the area where she was found. I got to that area there, and I started choking her with my hands, and she passed out after a while. You know, the oxygen got cut off to her head, and she just stopped. And then I pulled out the knife and stabbed her many times in the throat, and she was still alive. Then she stood up, and we walked around and all that, just walking around a few steps, and then I threw her on the ground and stuck my foot over her neck to finish her off. He continued in his straightforward manner, despite how gruesome the details became. The interrogation video has an account of him showing detectives just how he strangled Elizabeth, employing his thumb into her throat, and how he had stabbed her throat. He even remembered in clear detail the trauma signs Elizabeth displayed right before her death in the form of shaking. But he continued to recount all of this without any emotion. And the motive for all this violence? Denyer stated that he just wanted to kill, just wanted to take a life because I felt my life had been taken many times. Immediately after her death, Denyer had then left Elizabeth Stevens' body near the drain and disposed of the knife now in pieces and which he had made himself, along his route back home. Of course, this wasn't the only crime in which he had made use of his fake gun or homemade knives. He also confessed in detail to the July 8th incident with Mrs. Toth, having also come up from behind her after following her from the station in Seaford, and having placed his hand over her mouth to ensure she didn't scream. Instead, Mrs. Toth had bit his finger through to the bone as she put up a fight that ultimately ended up with her being able to escape him. Mrs. Toth at first couldn't get the attention of any passing cars, and Denyer had initially not given up, chasing after her and grabbing her by the hair. He tried similar threats as he had used on Elizabeth. Shut up or I'll blow your goddamned head off. And Mrs. Toth supposedly nodded and started to go with him, until she tried again to escape and successfully caught the attention of another car. At this point... Denyer left to evade being caught. And what would he have done if he had been successful in getting her to go with him? I was just going to drag her into the park and kill her. That's all. That same night, he went back to the train station and got on as if nothing had happened, heading toward Frankston and departing the bus at Kananook. It was nearby this station that Debbie Freem was on her milk run, stepping out of her grey pulsar, which Denyer decided to enter via the rear door and crouch down to wait. She got in, unaware, and began to drive. It was at that time Denyer began to use his fake gun routine to gain control of the situation. I waited for her to start up the car so no one would hear her scream or anything, Denyer conveyed. And she put it into gear, and she went to do a U-turn. I startled her just as she was doing that turn and she kept going into the wall of the milk bar, which caused a dent in the bonnet. I told her to, you know, shut up or I'd blow her head off and all that. He even admitted to noticing the baby car seat in the back when the police asked him if anything was in the back seat, and so the knowledge that she was the mother of a small child did not even deter him. Guiding her to a remote area, Denyer continued to threaten her. I told her when we got there if she gave any signals to anyone, I'd blow her head off. I'd decorate the car with her brains. The terrified woman drove until she was told to pull over by a stand of trees. In the darkness and cover of the woods, he presented a new addition to his collection of tools, a simple cord. I popped it over her eyes real quickly, so she didn't see it, because I was going to strangle her, but I didn't want her to see the cord first. I lifted the cord up and said, Can you see this? And she just put her hand up to grab it to feel it, and when she did that, I just yanked on it real quickly around her neck. And then I was struggling with her for about five minutes. After strangling Debbie with the cord until she was all but lifeless, he proceeded to use his knife to stab her in the neck and chest. She started breathing out of her neck, just like Elizabeth Stevens, he told the detectives. I could hear bubbling noises. 
Just as Mrs. Toth had, Debbie fought for her life, but the isolated area gave her little chance to overcome her attacker. He was recorded as saying, Yeah, she put up quite a fight, and her white jumper was pulled off during that time as well. I just felt the same way I did when I killed Elizabeth Stevens. As the single stab to the stomach was noticeable, the police inquired about that specifically. I lifted her up top and then plowed the knife into her gut. I wanted to see how big her boobs were. He said that when he saw Debbie's bare stomach, he just lunged at it with the knife. When it was obvious Debbie was no longer alive, he disposed of her body in the trees, covering it with some branches which he said he broke off himself from the surrounding trees. Realizing that he had dropped his knife, he spent some time, perhaps five minutes, searching the area until he recovered it and took it with him. He actually used Debbie Freem's car to get back closer to home, leaving it to walk the rest of the way. Once there, he called Sharon, who was at work, and arranged a meter to pick her up at the Cannonook Railway Station, where the incident had all begun. But why had he killed Debbie Freem? Same reason why I killed Elizabeth Stevens. I just wanted to, came the chilling answer. It was not until the next morning that Denyer had seemed to think anything of the other contents of the car he had abandoned. He actually had the guts to go back to it, in order to retrieve certain items, the milk, eggs, chocolate and cigarettes, which had all been from the milk bar, and Debbie's purse. He intended to dispose of all these, dumping the milk and eggs, burning the cartons, and burying the purse in a golf course. Obviously aware that his possession of any evidence could lead to his being caught, he hid the knife parts in the flat's laundry room air vent. Yet, he admitted all this freely now. This golf course would be the same one near where he killed Natalie Russell, along the bike track. This was no coincidence, though, and police were about to learn of one major difference between the previous attacks and this final one. So far, the questioning had resulted in confessions for all but one of the crimes Denier was the main suspect for, and the process had taken a total of 12 hours. If what had been shared so far wasn't enough to convince everyone that Paul Denier was beyond all hope of being human and needed to be locked up for life and stripped of all freedoms, then what he was about to share would certainly ensure his fate was sealed. In this chapter of Denier's confession, he freely admits that a certain level of planning went into Natalie Russell's murder. He had a desire to abduct a young woman, and although he didn't have a specific target in mind, he did have a location the bike track at the Flora and Fauna Reserve in nearby Langwarren. Then, under the cover of woods, just as in the other cases, he would murder the young woman. As the reserve was bordered by a wire fence, he came prepared with pliers, making a hole in three separate places through which he could drag his victim into the woods. He did this much earlier in the day and then returned to the site in the afternoon. He only had to wait about 20 minutes after he arrived at 2.30 before a young woman entered the path off the road from John Paul College. She wore a blue school uniform. Following his victim, and armed with another homemade knife and leather strap, he told the investigators, I stuck about ten yards behind her until I got to the second hole. And just when I got to that hole, I quickly walked up behind her and stuck my left hand around her mouth and held the knife to her throat. And that's where that cut happened. I cut that on my own blade. He explained his thumb with the missing skin. As Natalie struggled, he threatened her, and then she supposedly started to offer him things in exchange for her life. She said, you can have all my money, have sex with me and things. Just said disgusting things like that, really. He did not realize how perverse it was that he would be so disgusted by the victim he was attacking. This was the only emotion he seemed to show throughout all of the interviews, unless you count the almost sense of pride he gave off. The cut on her face happened as Denier compelled Natalie to kneel in front of him and then lie down, as he held the knife near her eye. He held her by the throat, and she struggled, and he cut her face as she managed to stand back up. She screamed. And I just said, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! And, if you don't shut up, I'll kill you. If you don't do this, I'll kill you. If you don't do that, Denier described his response. And she said, what do you want from me? I said, all I want you to do is shut up. And so when she was kneeling on the ground, I put the strap around her neck to strangle her, and it broke in half. And then she started violently struggling for about a minute, until I pushed, got her onto her back again, and pushed her head back like this and cut her throat. 
Denyer had no issue demonstrating the details of his actions as he spoke. I cut a small cut at first, and then she was bleeding. And then I stuck my fingers into her throat and grabbed her cords and I twisted them. When asked why he would do that, he answered, My whole fingers, like that much of my hand, was inside her throat. When asked again, he gave more details. Stop her from breathing. And then she slowly stopped. She sort of started to faint, and then she was weak. A bit weaker. I grabbed the opportunity of throwing her head back and one big large cut which sort of cut almost her whole head off. And then she slowly died. While most can imagine the job of a detective can be tough, listening to the confessions and working at scenes of a serial killer brought the detectives through such a dark side of humanity, it was hard to keep composure to finish the interrogation. Yet they asked, for the sake of thoroughness, Why did you kill her? Just the same reason as before. Just everything came back through my mind again. I kicked her before I left. He said the kick was to ensure she was actually dead. And yet, he slashed her one more time after that. Ironically, he was almost caught then and there. As he walked back to his car with Natalie's blood still on his hands, he saw two officers examining his car because of its lack of plates and decided to leave it there and walk back to his flat, taking a different route. To conceal the evidence, he hid the knife again, but this time in the backyard. After cleaning up, he went about business as usual, picking up Sharon from work, and going on to socialize with her at her mother's home in town. Adding to the list of crimes, he then tacked on a confession about his neighbor's sister, Donna, and her cats. He even admitted that he had brought one of his knives to murder Donna, but she was not home by the time he had arrived. While that may have been the start of the violence against women in the area, Denyer admitted he had stalked women for years, just waiting for the right time, waiting for that silent alarm to trigger me off. Waiting for the sign. What was it about women that Denyer had such a problem with? I just hate him. I beg your pardon, said a Lachlan. I just hate him, Denyer repeated. Those particular girls? asked a Lachlan, in reference to Denyer's victims. Or women in general? General. The exception would be Sharon, who was apparently completely clueless about her boyfriend's doings while she was busy working to support them. Sharon's not like anyone else I know. I'd never hurt her. She's a kindred spirit, Denyer said. And so Denyer was formally charged with three counts of murder and initially one count of attempted murder. The charge for the incident with Mrs. Toth was changed to abduction later on. He pled guilty to all on December 15, 1993. Standing trial before Justice Frank Vincent at the Supreme Court of Victoria, the court heard expert testimony from a clinical psychologist Ian Joblin. While Denyer was awaiting trial in the months prior, Joblin had the opportunity to examine him. What he observed in Denyer was especially disturbing, as Denyer not only failed to show remorse, but also showed evidence of deriving great pleasure from discussing the murders. Denyer also took little responsibility for his life beyond admitting he had done these things. He blamed his parents and the way they raised him. He accused one of his older brothers of sexual abuse against him, and even his lack of employment as reasons why he became a serial killer. These excuses could have been the stories of many others, all who never became serial killers, though. His psychological condition was beyond someone who just hadn't had great luck in life. His very nature was aggressive, cruel, and thrived on the suffering of others, the suffering he himself caused. The term sadist was used to describe Denyer. He received pleasure, and albeit temporary satisfaction, every time he committed a murder. Very quickly, though, he would lose this satisfaction and then would set out to kill again. There was no cure for such a person or hope for them to readjust to society. With this and all of the murder evidence, along with his confession, Denyer was sentenced on December 20th of the same year the murders took place. He was given three terms of life imprisonment, plus eight years for the abduction charge, and no parole was set. Acknowledging the suffering of the community as a whole, the judge said, The fear you have caused to thousands of women in the community will be felt for a long time. For many, you are the fear that quickens their step as they walk home, or causes a parent to look anxiously at the clock when a child is late. To the dismay of many, especially the victims' families, Denyer won an appeal to the full court of the Supreme Court of Victoria. 
On July 29, 1994, his parole period was set at 30 years, which was still the highest set on record, besides that of Ashley Colston, who also murdered three people at age 35. Without a sentence of lifetime imprisonment, they could see a day when the Frankston serial killer would be released and just 50-some years old. Definitely still a threat to the community, considering mental health experts are unable to offer anything that could change such a person's bent towards violence and darkness. In September 1978, Rodney Alcala was a winning contestant on Chuck Barris's The Dating Game. Barris would later claim the show was a front for his work with the CIA. Alcala's tale is at least as lurid. The game show had recently been revamped to be more suggestive. It was as corny as ever. Alcala, with his long hair, leisure suit, gold chain, earrings, and pushy charms, fit the part perfectly. The episode introduced him to Bachelorette Cheryl Bradshaw as a successful photographer who got his start at the age of 13 when his father found him in the darkroom, fully developed. The host told Bradshaw that Alcala, from Los Angeles, was into skydiving and motorcycling. Alcala managed to be somewhat less awkward than his two competitors. Bradshaw, a teacher from Phoenix, Arizona, asked the three bachelors, hidden from her view behind a screen, to describe themselves. I'm serving you for dinner. What are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana and I look really good, the lean Alcala confidently told her. Peel me. Intrigued, Bradshaw then asked him to pretend to audition for her drama class. She suggested he take the part of a dirty old man. As a convicted sex offender, it was something he had some experience with already, so he just growled, Come on over here. Somehow, his come-ons worked, and the lucky pair won tennis lessons and a trip to Magic Mountain, one of the Los Angeles area's local amusement parks. But after talking to Alcala backstage, Bradshaw wisely decided that Alcala was less a swinging single than simply creepy. She never did accompany him on that date. More than 20 years later, Alcala would point to a tape of that dating game episode as proof that he'd already owned the pair of gold ball earrings that prosecutors would contend he was keeping as a trophy of his kills, along with a collection of photographs of his sexual assault and murder victims and targets. In January 2010, Rodney James Alcala started his third trial for the 1979 murder of a 12-year-old girl from Huntington Beach, California, Robin Samso. The courts had thrown out his two previous convictions on technicalities. Thanks to developments in DNA and blood evidence technology, in the 2010 trial, prosecutors would also charge him with the assaults and death of Jill Barcombe, Georgia Wickstead, Charlotte Lamb, and Jill Parento. He'd already been convicted of two sex crimes, and New York detectives now believe he also killed two women in Manhattan during the 70s. James Alcala was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1943. By the time he was 12, he and his mother and sisters were living in suburban Los Angeles. His father had run off. Alcala joined the army when he was 17 and served as an army clerk, but he only lasted a few years. In 1964, he had a nervous breakdown. A military psychiatrist described him as an antisocial personality. Discharged, he returned to Los Angeles and enrolled at UCLA, where he received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1968. That same year, he abducted and nearly killed an eight-year-old girl. Tally S., as the press would know her, was on her way to school in Hollywood when a passerby saw Rodney Alcala lure her into his car on Sunset Boulevard. The witness followed Alcala and the girl to his DeLong Prey Avenue apartment and called the police. By the time officers arrived on the scene, Alcala had bashed the girl's skull with a metal pipe and raped her. When they knocked, he stalled and snuck out the back, leaving the child nearly dead, surrounded by photography equipment. Los Angeles police detective Steve Hodel investigated. He says professors at UCLA told him he must have the wrong guy. They just couldn't imagine that the well-spoken, sophisticated art student could have committed such a crime. Alcala fled Los Angeles to New York to evade arrest. Under the name John Berger, Alcala balanced a playboy lifestyle with coursework at New York University, including a film class taught by future sex offender Roman Polanski. If NYPD investigators are right, 
Alcala also followed his crimes against Taliès with another attack, this one deadly. On June 12, 1971, someone raped Cornelia Michael Crilly and strangled her with her own nylon stockings, leaving her dead in her apartment at 427 East 83rd Street. The 23-year-old TWA flight attendant had just moved to the block, back then famous among Manhattan singles for its unusually high concentration of stewardesses and secretaries. Perhaps it struck the attacker as a fertile hunting ground. At the time of the discovery of the body, the NYPD initially suspected Crilly's boyfriend, Leon Borstein. They now believe that Rodney Alcala committed the crime and say that saliva evidence ties him to the crime scene. Borstein was then a Brooklyn assistant district attorney. He has since served as a chief special prosecutor for New York City. Borstein thinks Crilly met Alcala as she moved into her new apartment. He speculates that the friendly young woman might have accepted Alcala's help in moving some furniture. With the cops distracted by Borstein, Alcala slipped away again. Still using the John Berger alias, he took a job at a drama camp near New Hampshire's Lake Sunapee when two teenage girls took shelter from a sudden summer storm in the post office of the tiny village of George's Mills. They noticed that their camp counselor, John Berger, looked a lot like the Rodney Alcala pictured on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted poster. The authorities were seeking Alcala for the California assault on young Talies. The campers alerted authorities, and in August of 1971, Alcala was arrested for that crime. The Crilly case was still open, but Alcala was found guilty and sentenced for kidnapping and raping Talies. Thanks to then-lenient California laws that emphasized rehabilitating sex offenders rather than putting them away, he served only 34 months, despite indications that the girl would have died from her injuries had the witness not led police to Alcala's apartment so quickly. Rodney Alcala would soon be free to strike again. In 1974, a 13-year-old girl known in trial reports as Julie J. made an emergency call claiming that a man had kidnapped her in Huntington Beach. She had been waiting for the bus, and Rodney Alcala had offered her a ride to school. He then refused to let the panicked girl out of his car until they got to Bolsa Chica State Beach. He dragged Julie to the cliffs, forced her to smoke marijuana, and kissed her. Alcala was convicted only of violating parole and furnishing a minor with marijuana. He spent just another two years in prison. When he got out, Alcala's trusting parole officer gave him permission to go to New York to visit relatives for the summer of 1977. David Berkowitz, better known as the son of Sam, would be arrested that August for a two-year crime spree during which he shot seven young women and two men around New York City. Alcala allegedly added to this summer of terror. NYPD investigators believe Alcala murdered a young Manhattan socialite that summer. Ellen Hover, 23, was the daughter of Herman Hover, the owner of Ciro's, a legendary Hollywood nightclub. Ciro's was first the epitome of big band swing, the height of Rat Pack glamour. Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin served as Ellen's godfathers. Her grandmother was a gossip writer. Her aunt, Sheila Weller, writes for Vanity Fair. Ellen Hover was last seen in her apartment on 3rd Avenue at 44th Street on July 15, 1977. Her date book showed that she had an appointment to meet with one John Berger that same day. Her stepfather hired a private investigator, and the family took out an ad in the New York Times, soliciting information on the mysterious John Berger. Alcala simply moved back to Los Angeles, reverted to his own name, and got a job as a typesetter at the Los Angeles Times. No one came forward with information on John Berger until later that year. A tip to the FBI pointed out that a New Hampshire drama camp counselor named John Berger had been taken away by the police a few years before. The FBI finally connected the dots and questioned Alcala in Los Angeles. He admitted knowing Ellen Hover, but investigators hadn't yet found her body, so they let him go and apparently filed the case away. Ellen Hover's body was eventually found on the Rockefeller Estate in North Terrytown, New York, just miles from a Hover family summer house, and mere yards from where an aspiring model would later report that Berger had taken photos of her. Meanwhile, Rodney Alcala was up to his old tricks. While New York was busy with the Son of Sam killings, Los Angeles endured the Hillside Strangler, which actually turned out to be two men who were killing young women 
and dumping their bodies in the wooded ravines around the city. And Los Angeles also had Rodney Alcala again. The Los Angeles Police Department initially thought the murder of Jill Barcombe, 18, was the Hillside Strangler's work. Jill Barcombe was a runaway originally from Brooklyn. One of 11 kids, she'd volunteered as a candy striper and played the trumpet in high school. She was barely five feet tall and weighed less than 100 pounds when her abductor picked her up on Sunset Boulevard. Her lifeless body showed up on a service road off Mulholland Drive, near Marlon Brando's home, in November 1977. The discovery of Barcombe's corpse interrupted a film shoot. She was nude, kneeling as if she'd been deliberately posed. Her skull had been crushed, probably with a bloodied rock found nearby. She'd been sexually assaulted, and she'd been strangled three times, with a belt, with her pantyhose, and with one of her pants legs. Investigators now say that DNA evidence at the scene matches Alcala. The Hillside Strangler Task Force eventually followed Alcala to his mother's home, interviewing him there in March 1978. They were questioning all sex offenders in the area. They didn't actually suspect him of the killings, but did charge him with possession of a small amount of marijuana. He was out of jail on the drug charge by the end of June. Soon after, he appeared on the dating game. But Rodney Alcala had already claimed other victims. In December 1977, Georgia Wickstead, a 27-year-old nurse, was discovered dead in her Malibu apartment. This was just a month after Jill Barcombe's murder, and a mere few days after the FBI had questioned Rodney Alcala regarding Ellen Hover's death in New York earlier that year. Wickstead, 27, was last seen when she drove another nurse, Barbara Gale, home from a bar. When she didn't show up for work the next day, Gale and her co-workers reported her missing. Police arrived at Wickstead's apartment to find signs of forced entry. Wickstead was posed naked on her bedroom floor, strangled with her nylons. She'd been assaulted, and her skull had been bashed in, apparently with a nearby hammer. Prosecutors now say DNA evidence and a handprint found at the scene match Alcala's. Rodney Alcala's crimes seemed to have been falling into a pattern, but no one saw it at the time. In June 1978, Charlotte Lamb, a 32-year-old legal secretary from Santa Monica, was found dead under similar circumstances in the laundry room of the apartment complex where she was living in El Segundo. She'd been assaulted, beaten, and strangled with a shoelace, and was posed with her hands behind her back. DNA at the scene would once again turn out to match that of Rodney Alcala, and DNA on a pair of earrings found in his storage locker after Robin Samso's murder would eventually prove to match Lamb's DNA. Alcala had been interviewed by the Hillside Strangler Task Force in conjunction with Jill Barcombe's death just weeks before he allegedly raped and killed Lamb. There would be more. In February 1979, Rodney Alcala later confessed, he picked up a 15-year-old hitchhiker in Riverside County. He drove Monique H. to his apartment and they engaged in intercourse, supposedly with her consent. In the morning, they drove to the mountains. Alcala took nude photos of her, as well as several of the two of them simulating sex acts. But he scared her. She screamed and tried to get away. He tied her up, beat and raped her. In his confession, he would claim that it hadn't been planned and that things had gone wrong. He'd lost control of the situation. He drove her back to Riverside. From a motel, she called the police to report the rape and kidnapping. Rodney Alcala's mother posted bail, and he would strike again. In June 1979, Jill Parento, a 21-year-old computer key punch operator, left work early to go to a baseball game. When she didn't make it to work the next day, police went to her Burbank apartment to investigate. They once again found a scene of forced entry and a woman dead. Parento was dead, naked on her bathroom floor. She was posed with pillows under her shoulders. She'd been assaulted, beaten, and strangled. Her killer cut himself crawling in a window. Blood evidence matching that of 3% of the population did not rule out or confirm Rodney Alcala as the perpetrator. Parento's friend, Catherine Bryant testified that she and Parento had met Alcala at a club several times. The same month that Jill Parento was raped and murdered, 
Alcala allegedly killed an underage girl. On June 20, 1979, Robin Samso, a 12-year-old Huntington Beach girl, was on her way to ballet class. She was late, so she'd borrowed her best friend's yellow Schwinn bicycle. She and the bicycle disappeared that day. Her decomposing body was later found in the foothills of the Sierra Madres. Earlier, neighbor Jackie Young had chased a strange man away from Robin Samso and her friend, Bridget Wilvert, when they were playing along Huntington Beach's low cliffs. According to Young, the man was trying to get little girls in swimsuits to let him photograph them. Young and Wilvert would later provide police with information that helped them produce a sketch that a parole officer would recognize as Rodney Alcala. Tony Esparza, 15, and Joanne Merchland, 14, would later testify that on June 19th at the same beach, a man fitting Alcala's description had offered them marijuana and begged to take their photos for a bikini contest. Several other witnesses, including Lorraine Wirtz and Patty Elmendorf, said that Alcala had accosted them on June 20th. Esparza and Merchland came forward when they saw Alcala on the news. Wirtz was contacted after police found a photo of Wirtz in Alcala's Seattle storage locker. Dana Crappa, then working as a ranger in the Los Angeles National Forest, had testified that she saw a man trying to lead a girl down to a stream the same day that Robin Samso disappeared. She says he was driving a Datsun F10, which was the make and model that Alcala owned in 1979. Twelve days after Samso's disappearance, William Popke, another U.S. Parks Ranger, found Robin Samso's decomposing remains. He initially assumed they were deer bones and tossed one to Crappa. Robin's left foot and portions of her hands were missing, and her skull had been separated from her neck. A kitchen knife and one of her shoes were nearby. The decomposition meant that investigators were unable to determine whether she'd been raped. On July 24, 1979, police arrested Alcala at his mother's Monterey Park home. They soon charged him with the murder of Robin Samso. The story was far from over. When investigators searched Rodney Alcala's mother's house, they found a receipt for a storage locker in Seattle. The locker held numerous photographs of young girls, including one of Lori Wirtz. They also found a pair of gold ball earrings allegedly worn by Robin Samso and belonging to her mother. Alcala still claims he'd long owned those himself. The second pair of earrings, with tiny roses, would, years later, reveal Charlotte Lamb's DNA. Police believe that Alcala was keeping the photos and earrings as trophies of his crimes. Alcala apparently spent just a few days in Seattle that July. He told his girlfriend, Elizabeth Keller, that he'd been in Dallas, where he said he was planning to open a photography studio. He told other friends and acquaintances that he was moving to Chicago. With the evidence from the storage locker and testimony from witnesses, prosecutors brought Alcala to trial for his crimes against Robin Samso. Robin Samso's mother, Marianne Connolly, brought a 25 caliber pistol to the trial. She ultimately decided not to use it, believing that the legal system would deal justly with her daughter's killer. Alcala had an alibi. He claimed at the time of her abduction, he was at Knott's Berry Farm, applying for a job to become a disco photographer. Alcala's sisters, Christine de la Cerda and Marie Troiano, and his mother insisted that Alcala had called both sisters from his mother's house around the time of Robin's abduction. While those calls do appear on phone bills, there's no way of confirming whether Alcala or his mother made them. In 1978, Rodney James Alcala was found guilty of first-degree murder with a deadly weapon and kidnapping. The kidnapping charge qualified as a special circumstance that exposed him to the death penalty. Marianne Connolly, though, never worked again, and she developed a drug problem. Robin's three siblings, Tara Ann, Tim, and Robert, were never the same because Alcala's conviction was overturned twice. Rodney Alcala was twice found guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Robin Samso. Both convictions were overturned on technicalities, first by the California Supreme Court in 1984, then by a U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in 2001. In 1984, the California Supreme Court decided that the jury shouldn't have been allowed to hear about Alcala's other convictions. Furthermore, the judges believed that two of Alcala's inmates who testified against him had perjured themselves. 
Robert Dove and Michael Herrera testified that Alcala had told Herrera that he had lured the girl into his car by offering her money for photos and promising to drive her to her ballet class. Dove had overheard the conversation, in which Alcala allegedly had told Herrera that he hadn't stabbed the girl, but beat her unconscious. Herrera also said that Alcala told him that he'd left the girl's bicycle behind a thrift store. The owner of a thrift store in El Monte testified that he had indeed found a child's yellow Schwinn behind his shop. In 2001, the defense claimed that the prosecution hadn't properly handled Dana Crappa's statements. She had claimed amnesia and didn't testify during the second trial, but her previous testimony was presented in her absence. Alcala remained in prison, and he's been keeping himself busy. He's tried to sue the California state prison system over a fall that he took and over refusing to provide him with a low-fat diet. He's spoken out against the new state policy of routinely testing and comparing DNA, the practice that has tied him to the rapes or murders of Jill Barcombe, Georgia Wixted, Charlotte Lamb, and Jill Parento. And in 1994, he wrote a book defending himself, You, the Jury. He still denies that he killed Robin Samso. He's flip-flopped, first saying that an insanity defense exculpates him in the deaths of Barcombe, Wixted, Lamb, and Parento, and then insisting that he didn't kill them either. But now he's on trial for the deaths of the girl and all four women. Rodney James Alcala was accused of killing Robin Samso, Jill Barcombe, Georgia Wixted, Charlotte Lamb, and Jill Parento. He was eligible for the death penalty due to special circumstances because he was accused of multiple murders as well as murder during rape or kidnapping. He objected to trying the five murders in a single case. Superior Court Judge Francisco P. Brizeno presided over the case in Santa Ana, California. Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy was prosecuting. During dating game killer Rodney Alcala's 2010 trial, Orange County Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy called Alcala a monster and said he deserved to die. He told the jury that Alcala was a hunter who stalked and killed his prey simply because he liked it. Murphy alleged that Alcala would strangle victims with his bare hands until they passed out. He'd strangle them again with pantyhose or shoelaces. Once they were dead, he'd pose their bodies and take pictures. On February 25, 2010, a third jury found dating game killer Rodney Alcala guilty of the 1979 murder and kidnapping of Huntington Beach ballerina Robin Samso, 12. They also finally found him guilty of first-degree murder in the deaths of four adult women, Jill Barcombe, Georgia Wixted, Charlotte Lamb, and Jill Parento. On March 30, 2010, Judge Francisco Brizeno sentenced him to death for the crimes. It was Alcala's third death sentence. The verdict in his other two trials for Samso's murder were overturned. If third time's the charm, maybe the sentence will stick this time. But the haunting contents of Alcala's Seattle storage locker have left Huntington Beach police fearing that this fiend's crimes weren't limited to the deadly sexual assaults in Southern California for which this trial has hopefully finally brought justice. Unsurprisingly, the trial was a circus. Alcala defended himself. Judge Brizeno had to speak privately with Alcala numerous times throughout the proceedings to explain basic legal terms to him and to curb the 66-year-old's theatrics. New forensic evidence buttressing the charges against Alcala for his crimes against the women was supplemented by testimony from two other victims whom he'd long been convicted and sentenced for assault. He'd picked up Monique H. to take photographs, brought her to a secluded rural area, then beat sodomized, and raped her. Alcala did what he could to avoid the charges and their penalty. Early in the trial, he showed a clip from his winning 1978 appearance on television's Dating Game, claiming that it showed him already wearing the earrings that supposedly tied him to the Samso murder. Jurors seemed to have trouble making out the earrings and the grainy footage. They weren't convinced by his defense. In his closing arguments, Alcala told jurors that if they gave him the death penalty, they would be killers themselves. He then played them an extract from Arlo Guthrie's Alice's Restaurant Massacre, a sprawling anti-Vietnam epic. I want to kill. I mean, I wanna, I wanna kill. Kill. I wanna, I wanna see, 
I want to see blood and gore and guts and veins in my teeth. I mean kill, 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 kill. Alcala reminded the jury that he would fight a death sentence and it would be automatically appealed. He suggested that a life sentence would be easiest for everyone. The families of the victims spoke at the sentencing. In 2005, Jill Barcombe's brother Bruce had sent Alcala a present, a copy of Out of the Shadows, a book on sex addiction. With the book, he had sent a letter in which he begged Alcala to spare the families the pain of a trial and confess to any murders he'd committed. Clearly, Bruce Barcombe hadn't persuaded this brutal killer to come clean. After Alcala was convicted, Huntington Beach detectives released photos from the Shoreline Washington storage locker where Alcala had squirreled away trophies from his attacks, including photos of many of his victims, as well as earrings that linked him to Robin Samso and Charlotte Lamb. The suburban Seattle locker also held hundreds of photos of women and children, both boys and girls, often at the beach or park, sometimes nude. Some of these photos had addresses scrawled on the back. Police have tracked down those families and were able to confirm that their loved ones were still alive. Authorities continue to hope people who recognize the other photographs will come forward. Seattle police requested DNA samples so they can determine whether Alcala was behind the deaths of two teenagers killed in Seattle in the 1970s. Antoinette Whitaker, 13, was found dead in a vacant lot in northeast Seattle's Lake City in July 1977. Joyce Gaunt, 17, was found dead in South Seattle's Seward Park in February 1978. Whitaker had not been assaulted, but the developmentally disabled Gaunt had been. Detectives have requested a DNA comparison to see whether Alcala is a match. The King County Sheriff's Office was also looking into whether Alcala may have been responsible for deaths in the surrounding area, including that of Cherry Greenman, who disappeared from Waterville, Washington at the age of 19 in 1976. Just as the Los Angeles Police Department originally attributed Jill Barcombe's death to the Hillside Strangler, authorities at one time had looked for a link between Greenman and the Green River Killer. New Hampshire investigators are looking into whether Alcala may have been responsible for any crimes when he worked, as John Berger, as a camp counselor in the area between 1969 and 1971. Rodney Alcala also remains a person of interest in the deaths of heiress Ellen Hover and TWA stewardess Cornelia Michael Crilly in New York in the 1970s. In March 2010, the Huntington Beach, California and New York City Police Departments released 120 of Alcala's photographs and sought the public's help in identifying them in the hopes of determining if any of the women and children he photographed were additional victims. Approximately 900 additional photos could not be made public, police said, because they were too sexually explicit. In the first few weeks, Police reported that approximately 21 women had come forward to identify themselves. And at least six families said they believed they recognized loved ones who disappeared years ago and were never found. None of the photos was unequivocally connected to a missing person case or unsolved murder until 2013, when a family member recognized the photo of Christine Thornton, 28, whose body was found in Wyoming in 1982. As of July 2021, 110 of the original photos remain posted online, and police continue to solicit the public's help with further identifications. In September 2016, Alcala was charged with the murder of 28-year-old Christine Ruth Thornton, who disappeared in 1977. In 2013, a relative recognized her as the subject of one of Alcala's photos, made public by Huntington Beach PD and NYPD. Her body was found in Sweetwater County, Wyoming, in 1982, but was not identified until 2015, when DNA supplied by Thornton's relatives matched tissue samples from her remains. Alcala admitted taking the photo, but not to killing the woman, who was approximately six months pregnant at the time of her death. Thornton is the first alleged murder victim linked to the Alcala photos made public in 2010. The 73-year-old Alcala was reportedly too ill to make the journey from California to Wyoming to stand trial on the new charges. Alcala died of unspecified natural causes in Corcoran, California, on July 24, 2021, at the age of 77. 
During the 1960s, when there was no shortage of drama in the nation's courtrooms, one murder case stood alone in its ability to shock the country. The crime was not as gruesome as some others, since many more were just as violent, and still more that easily surpassed it. The victim was an ordinary working girl, not at all wealthy, and not a member of any elite class. Her name was Catherine Genovese, the 28-year-old daughter of Italian-American parents. But to millions of people who read her story when it first appeared in New York City's press, she would forever be remembered as Kitty Genovese. What happened to her, what happened to all of society on that dreadful night in the spring of 1964, would reverberate across the country and generate a national soul-searching that's reserved for only the most catastrophic of events. Her name has become synonymous with a dark side of an urban character that, for many people, represents a harsh and disturbing reality of big city life. During the 1940s and into the 1950s, the Genovese family lived and worked in Brooklyn, New York. In the 1940s, Catherine's father, Vincent A. Genovese, started his own business of supplying coats and aprons to local businesses. It was called the Bay Ridge Coat and Apron Supply Company. He became moderately successful, and in 1954, he and his wife Rachel decided to move to New Canaan, Connecticut. The decision came shortly after Rachel had witnessed a shooting near their home. By that time, they had five children, the oldest being Catherine, who was 19. But she chose to remain behind in New York and stick it out while the rest of the family moved to the suburbs. Catherine was an attractive, outgoing woman who liked Latin American music and loved to dance. A graduate of Brooklyn's Prospect Heights High School in 1954, she was also interested in history and politics and could debate on many issues. I remember that she loved to talk politics and knew a great deal about what was going on, said her younger brother, Bill Genovese. She was a Renaissance woman, interested in a lot of different subjects, he said. By 1963, she had moved to Queens. She rented an apartment located on the second floor of a commercial building on Austin Street in the Kew Gardens section of Queens, a quiet, mostly residential area. She shared her space with a girlfriend, Marianne Zielonko. Catherine later got a job as a bar manager in Ev's 11th Hour Club, a small neighborhood tavern on Jamaica Avenue and 193rd Street in the Hollis section of the borough. The bar was about five miles from her apartment, and she drove her red Fiat to the restaurant nearly every night. She worked late, sometimes into the early morning hours. It made her nervous to return to her apartment in the dark, but it was something that could not be avoided. And being a city girl her whole life, Catherine had the typical resiliency and determination of a native New Yorker. On weekends, she would come to visit the family in New Canaan, but it was never enough. Catherine was always busy with her career and running back and forth to Connecticut and New York City. She wanted to visit Italy and dreamed of one day opening an Italian restaurant with her father in New Canaan. Her parents worried about her living in Queens, but accepted it as a part of city life and as what she wanted. But her heart was never far from her family. I believe she found an inner peace when she spent weekends with us in Connecticut, said Vince. She was full of life. The city was one part of her. New Canaan was another. Along a serene, tree-lined street in the Kew Gardens section of Queens, New York City, Catherine Genovese began the last walk of her life in the early morning hours of March 13, 1964. She had just left work, and it was 3.15 a.m. when she parked her red Fiat in the Long Island Railroad parking lot 20 feet from her apartment door at 8270 Austin Street. As she locked her car door, she took notice of a figure in the darkness walking quickly toward her. She became immediately concerned as soon as the stranger began to follow her. As she got out of the car, she saw me and ran, the man told the court later. I ran after her and I had a knife in my hand. She must have thought that since the entrance to her building was so close, she would reach safety within seconds. But the man was faster than she thought. At the corner of Austin Street and Lefferts Boulevard, there is a police call box, which linked directly to the 112th Precinct. She may have changed direction to call for assistance, but it was too late. The man caught up with Catherine, who was all of 5 foot 1 inches and weighed just 105 pounds, near a streetlight at the end of the parking lot. I could run much faster than she could, and I jumped on her back and stabbed her several times, the man later told cops. Oh my God, he stabbed me, 
she screamed. Please help me. Please help me. Some apartment lights went on in nearby buildings. Irene Frost at 8268 Austin Street heard Catherine's screams plainly. There was another shriek, she later testified in court, and she was lying down, crying out. Up on the seventh floor of the same building, Robert Moser slid open his window and observed the struggle below. Hey, let that girl alone, he yelled down into the street. The attacker heard Moser and immediately walked away. There was quiet once again in the dark. The only sound was the sobbing of the victim, struggling to her feet. The lights in the apartment went out again. Catherine, bleeding badly from several stab wounds, managed to reach the side of her building and held onto the concrete wall. She staggered over to a locked door and tried to stay conscious. Within five minutes, the assailant returned. He stabbed her again. I'm dying, I'm dying, she cried to no one. But several people in her building heard her screams. Lights went on once again and some windows opened. Tenants tried to see what was happening from the safety of their apartments. The attacker then ran to a white Chevy Corsair at the edge of the railroad parking lot and seemed to drive away. On the sixth floor of 8240 Austin Street, Marjorie and Samuel Koshkin witnessed the attack from their window. I saw a man hurry to a car under my window, he later said. He left and came back five minutes later and was looking around the area. Mr. Koshkin wanted to call the police, but Mrs. Koshkin thought otherwise. I didn't let him, she later told the press. I told him there must have been 30 calls already. Miss André Pique, a French girl who lived on the second floor, heard the commotion from her window. I heard a scream for help three times, she later told the court. I saw a girl lying down on the pavement with a man bending down over her, beating her. At about 3.25 a.m., Catherine, bleeding badly, stumbled to the rear of her apartment building and attempted to enter through a back entrance. The door was locked. She slid along the wall until she reached a hallway leading to the second floor of 8262 Austin Street, but she fell to the vestibule floor. In the meantime, the man had returned again. I came back because I knew I'd not finished what I set out to do, he told cops later. He walked along the row of doors and calmly searched for the woman. He checked the first door and didn't find her. He followed the trail of blood to the doorway where Catherine lay bleeding on the tiled floor. And there, while the defenseless victim lay semi-conscious, incoherent from pain and loss of blood, he cut off her bra and underwear and assaulted her. He then took $49 in cash from her wallet. Why would I throw the money away? He asked the court at his trial. As Catherine moaned at his feet, probably unable to comprehend what had happened to her, the man viciously stabbed her again and killed her. The man, who had selected his victim purely at random, ran to his car still parked where he left it. The entire event had lasted 32 minutes. He said later that murder was an idea that came into my mind, just as an idea might come into your mind, but I couldn't put mine aside. He jumped into his white sedan and fled the scene. A few blocks away, he came to a red light. He glanced over at the car idling next to him and saw that a man was asleep behind the wheel. The killer got out of his car and awakened the sleeping driver. He told the man he should go home. Then the killer, full of himself, $49 richer and not at all ashamed of what he had done, got back into his own car and drove off into the night. Catherine was his third murder. At about 3.50 a.m., a neighbor, Carl Ross, who lived on the second floor of Catherine's building on Austin Street, finally called the police. But before he did, he called a friend in nearby Nassau County and asked his opinion about what he should do. After the police were notified, a squad car arrived within three minutes and quickly found Catherine's body in the hallway on the first floor. She had been stabbed 17 times. Her torn and cut clothes were scattered about her and her open wallet lay on the floor next to her. Her driver's license identified her as Catherine Genovese. Detectives from the 112th responded and began an exhaustive investigation. It was a frigid winter morning and a brisk, unrelenting wind made it seem even colder. A canvas of the neighborhood turned up several witnesses, including the one who had notified the police. When cops finished polling the immediate neighborhood, they discovered at least 38 people had heard or observed some part of the fatal assault on Kitty Genovese. 
Kew Gardens is a residential area located at the center of the borough of Queens, one of the most populated communities in America. If Queens were a city, it would be America's fifth largest. The area of Kew Gardens is generally middle class where houses in 1964 typically sold for thirty to fifty thousand dollars. It resembled a small village in the suburbs rather than a city neighborhood. Mostly white, working class, and typically one of the hundreds of small communities that made up metropolitan New York City, Austin Street is the focal point of the neighborhood. On this neat, picturesque avenue, there are shops, a small park, and a busy train station where commuters catch the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central, 15 minutes away. Not the kind of place where one would think a person could be murdered without anyone offering even a smidgen of assistance. We thought it was a lover's quarrel, said one tenant. Frankly, we were afraid, said another witness. One woman who didn't want her name used said, I didn't want my husband to get involved. Others had different explanations for their conduct. We went to the window to see what was happening, but the light from our bedroom made it difficult to see the street. There were lots of excuses. Maybe the most apathetic was the one who told reporters, I was tired. But the mere fact remained that dozens of people stood by and watched a human being being brutally assaulted for an extended period of time and did nothing. If we had been called when he was first attacked, the woman might not be dead now, an assistant chief inspector told the press at the time. New York City Deputy Police Commissioner Walter Arms said, This tendency to shy away from reporting crimes is a common one. That was a revelation to the public. Some detectives were stunned. Others simply saw the unwillingness to get involved as representative of the times. Apathy, especially in urban settings, was everywhere, not only in Kew Gardens. In her own defense, one neighbor said she was too afraid to call. I tried. I really tried, she said, but I was gasping for air and was unable to talk into the telephone. As killings go, the murder of Catherine Genovese was not a spectacular one, nor did it generate much publicity when it happened. The original NYPD complaint report reduced the episode to just five typewritten lines. Carl Ross heard calls of help at his residence. He saw a woman, later identified as Kitty Genovese, lying face down in the ground floor hallway. She was taken to Queen's General Hospital with multiple stab wounds and pronounced dead on arrival, then taken to the morgue. There were hundreds of killings in New York City in 1964 and 9,360 murders in America that year. A random killing in the street was not big news. The New York Times delegated a few short paragraphs to the incident on page 12. For two weeks, it lay dormant and gathered virtually no public attention. It wasn't until March 27th when the Times published its famous 37 Who Saw Murder Didn't Call article by Martin Gansberg that the killing became big news. The New York City media picked up on the wider themes of the event. Camera crews and newscasters descended on Kew Gardens. The press searched the neighborhood for any scrap of uncovered information, no matter how small or insignificant. Kitty Genovese's story began to take shape. During the week after the murder, the 30 detectives who were assigned to the case sifted through the neighborhood of Kew Gardens and Forest Hills. They located a milkman who was able to furnish a description of a suspect. Others also had observed Catherine's killer in the area prior to the murder and were able to add to the description. But it wasn't until six days later, when a suspect was arrested stealing a television during a house burglary, that cops had their man, Winston Mosley, 29. Mosley had no criminal record. He was married owned a home in Queens, and had two kids. Slight of build, barely five foot eight, with thin features and a brooding appearance, Mosley was a machine operator who worked in Mount Vernon in nearby Westchester County. His arrest report, dated March 19, 1964, lists his occupation as Remington Rand tab operator. He did not seem to be the type of person who committed street muggings or murder, but Mosley quickly confessed to the Genovese killing and two others. He told cops that he had killed Barbara Kralik, 15, on July 20th in Springfield Gardens, Queens, and shot Annie Mae Johnson, 24, of South Ozone Park, Queens, on February 29th. Both were savage killings. Trouble was, another man named Alvin the Monster Mitchell, 18, a local gang member, was already in custody for the Kralik killing. He had allegedly also confessed to the teenager's murder, but Mosley was insistent. 
He had killed them all, he said. In the murder of Annie Mae Johnson, Mosley insisted that he shot the victim several times. I shot her in the stomach. I reloaded and shot her again in the stomach, he told cops. But the autopsy on Johnson had listed the cause of death as puncture wounds from a sharp object, such as a screwdriver or a file. Based on Mosley's confession, the body was exhumed from a cemetery in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, and a second autopsy was performed. Using X-ray equipment borrowed from a South Carolina medical college in Charleston, the coroner found six bullets inside Johnson's body. Four of these bullets were recovered. The finding of these bullets adds a lot of credence to Winston Mosley's other statements, Queens District Attorney Frank O'Connor told the press. In the murder of 15-year-old Barbara Kralik, there was no blood evidence available. No test yet existed that could compare bodily fluids for conclusive DNA identification. Mosley, however, was able to supply details that conform to the existing evidence. Cops were satisfied they had the right man. Even his own Crown-appointed attorney, Sidney G. Sparrow, believed Mosley. I'm convinced Mosley did all three of these killings, he told reporters after he met with his client for three hours in the Kings County psych ward. There are too many things he knew that only the killer could know, he added. But there was more. Mosley confessed to other attacks during nighttime expeditions in which he would roam the streets searching for victims at random. He said he had raped many women, frequently robbing them in the process. Mosley admitted to dozens of burglaries, including the one for which he was arrested when he was caught stealing a television. But it was the assaults that had detectives interested, particularly the failed attempts of rape which several women reported. Mosley, it seemed, preferred sex with the dead. Dr. Oscar Diamond, a psychiatrist for Manhattan State Hospital, performed a pretrial psychiatric examination of Mosley. He told me he got no thrill with live women he raped, he told the court later. By mid-April, the Kitty Genovese story had taken hold, and the nation began a lengthy period of analysis and self-deprecation. Why would civilized people turn away from another human being in dire need of assistance? As the details of the killing emerged, it became plain that if any of the 38 witnesses had simply called the police at the first sign of trouble, the victim could have survived. The initial stab wounds inflicted may not have been fatal. Timely medical treatment could have saved the life of Catherine Genovese. Were the witnesses really that cold-hearted? People wondered. Some psychologists blamed television for the sad state of affairs in Kew Gardens. In a symposium held in Manhattan's Barbizon Plaza Hotel in early April 1964, psychiatrist Ralph S. Benet said television was at least partly to blame. We underestimate the damage that these accumulated images do to the brain, he said. The immediate effect can be delusional, equivalent to a sort of post-hypnotic suggestion. The witnesses became confused and paralyzed by the violence they witnessed outside their window, he explained. They were fascinated by the drama by the action, and yet not entirely sure that what was taking place was actually happening, he said. That explanation fit in neatly with what some of the witnesses had told police. They claimed that when they saw the disturbance on Austin Street, they imagined it was an argument between a man and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend. None really thought that they were witnessing a real killing. We thought it was a lover's quarrel, one witness later said. Another neighbor repeated that assertion when he said, I thought there were some kids having some fun. Others complained of the media attention and said the press made the neighborhood look bad. These things happen every day all over the world, one neighbor told a reporter. The stories were only giving us a black eye. Dr. Carl Menninger, a world-renowned psychiatrist and founder of the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, also spoke at the symposium. Public apathy to crime is itself a manifestation of aggressiveness, he told the audience. People turn away for a variety of reasons, including their desire not to get involved. But were people in big cities more apathetic, colder, and indifferent than others in more rural environments? Or was the Kitty Genovese syndrome, as some psychologists characterized it, indicative of society as a whole? One dynamic brought forth was the bystander effect. This theory speculates that as the number of bystanders increases, the likelihood of any one bystander helping another decreases. As a result, additional time will pass before anyone seeks outside help for a person in distress. Another hypothesis is something called the diffusion of responsibility. This is simply a decrease in the feeling of personal responsibility one feels when in the presence of many other people. The greater the number of bystanders, 
the less responsibility the individual feels. In cases where there are many people present during an emergency, it becomes much more likely that any one individual will simply do nothing. In essence, the 38 witnesses felt no responsibility to act because there were so many witnesses. Each one felt that the other witness would do something. Social psychology research supports the notion that Catherine Genovese had a better chance of survival if she had been attacked in the presence of just one witness. Why had so many people stood by and done nothing while an innocent person was killed before their eyes? Seldom has the Times published a more horrifying story than its account of how 38 respectable, law-abiding, middle-class queen citizens watched a killer stalk his young woman victim without one of them making a call to the police department that might have saved her life, the Times wrote in an editorial on March 28th. It seemed to be too much for everyone to digest. Though psychologists had several theories to explain the depressing conduct of the people in Kew Gardens, some dismissed it as a natural extension of urban environment. To people who lived in middle America or small towns, the reaction of the witnesses to the Genovese murder was symbolic of the hectic life in cities like New York. To them, citizens in a large metropolis are not likely or willing to help a stranger in need, although many New Yorkers would disagree with that premise. Stanley Milgram, one of America's foremost researchers in social psychology, wrote in The Nation, the Kew Gardens incident has become the occasion for a general attack on the city. It's portrayed as callous, cruel, indifferent to the needs of the people, and wholly inferior to the small town and quality of its personal relationships. Others, like Lieutenant Bernard Jacobs of the NYCPD, who led the police investigation, could not understand the reactions of the 38. He told the press, where are they? In their homes? Near phones? Why should they be afraid to call the police? It was a good question. And there were disturbing answers as well. The police received a great deal of criticism from an angry public who had a deep resentment against what they perceived to be an indifferent, rude, and abusive police department. Have you ever reported anything to the police? One letter to the editor asked. If you did, you would know that you're subjected to insults and abuse from annoyed, undutiful police. Another frequent complaint was the difficulty of calling the local police precinct. In 1964, there was no universal 911 system. A caller had to dial the number to their precinct, and sometimes the call went somewhere else. The Genovese murder became a pivotal factor in changing the phone reporting procedure for the New York City Police Department. Dr. Iago Goldston, a New York City psychiatrist, said, I would assign this to the effect of the megalopolis in which we live, which makes closeness very difficult and leads to the alienation of the individual to the group. Another professor was not so kind when he wrote that the murder goes to the heart of whether this is a community or a jungle. The killing of Kitty Genovese soon became symbolic of all that was wrong with modern society, especially in cities. Apathy was endemic. Beginning in April of 1964, New York City newspapers printed a series of stories highlighting the apathy and callousness of citizens. One story, which appeared on June 8th in the Daily News, told of a distraught man who was perched on a 10-story ledge of a Broadway office building. As police tried to talk the man down, a large crowd gathered in the street and chanted, Jump! Jump! When the man was finally pulled off the ledge, the crowd loudly booed the cops. But an unidentified theologian provided the most telling piece of irony when he sought to explain the urban problem of indifference and the unwillingness of the ordinary person to become involved. I can't understand it. Maybe the depersonalizing here has gone farther than I thought, he told the Times. He then added, but don't quote me. The trial of Winston Mosley opened on June 8, 1964. Though he originally pled not guilty, his attorney, Sidney G. Sparrow, changed the plea at the last minute to not guilty by reason of insanity. Since Mosley had already provided detectives with a signed confession, which described exactly how he had performed the killing, there were not many options left to the defense. Many of the details of the murder made public were derived from the written confession, and to plead not guilty to the charges seemed ludicrous. Much to the chagrin of the defense team, however, Mosley was pronounced sane by a state psychiatrist. Four residents of the Kew Gardens neighborhood testified at the trial. One of them, Miss Peake, said that she saw Catherine Genovese lying in the street. The poor girl got up slowly, walking to the parking lot. I heard two last screams for help, but couldn't see her then. 
she said tearfully. Another resident, Robert Moser, said he yelled at the assailant who then ran away. I hollered, Hey, get out of there. What are you doing? He jumped up and ran like a scared rabbit. Took off really quick, he told the court. But it was Mosley himself who provided both drama and revulsion to the packed courtroom. He testified on the morning of June 11th, called to the stand by his own attorney, in the hope that the jury would see Winston Mosley was insane. Dressed in a neat, short-sleeved white shirt and speaking in a detached, clear voice, he answered almost every question in an even-handed manner. Sparrow asked his client about previous crimes, and Mosley admitted that he had stabbed and killed 15-year-old Barbara Kralik on July 20, 1963. Mosley also confessed on the stand to the shooting murder of Anne Mae Johnson on February 29, 1964. He said he shot Annie Johnson repeatedly on the night of February 20th. I intended to kill her, he told the court. I didn't think she was dead, so I shot her again. When he turned her over, Mosley said he saw that she was dead. I decided to rape her, he said without emotion. Then he dragged her body into her home, where he set fire to her naked body in her living room. In the Kralik murder, Mosley said he wanted to rape the teenager, but was scared away by someone in the house. I looked at her for maybe a few seconds, then I put my knife into her. As I was stabbing her, she squirmed free from my grip. I put my hand over her mouth and I stabbed her some more, he said to a hushed courtroom. When it was time to describe the Genovese murder, Mosley said that he went out on the night of March 13th for the purpose of killing someone. I went out that night intending to kill a woman, he told the court. When I got such a thought, it remained with me regardless of what I might be thinking, he said. I had a hunting knife that I had taken from a previous burglary, and I took that with me, he added. Mosley said that he followed Catherine from her car in the railroad parking lot to a nearby building where he stabbed her the first time. I plunged the knife into her back twice. She fell down, he said. He saw lights come on in the building across the street and then returned to his car to move it. I realized the car was parked where people could see it and me, so I moved it some distance away, he said. Mosley heard some of the tenants of the building yell down at him, but he said he was unconcerned. I had a feeling this man would close his window and go back to sleep, he said to cops. And sure enough, he did. On June 11th, the defense and prosecution summed up the case in front of the 11-man, one-woman jury. Sidney G. Sparrow tried hard to get the jury to accept the not guilty by reason of insanity plea. He tried to make the court understand that Winston Mosley lived a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde existence. By day, he had a regular job, was married, had a family, and seemed like any other ordinary citizen. But at night, he turned into a monster, addicted to murder and sexual frenzies. He said Mosley was a schizophrenic personality and legally insane. Was it sane for him to go on about what he was doing when 10, 20, 30, or 50 people were opening windows, opening and closing doors, yelling at him? He asked the jury. But the prosecuting attorney... Assistant District Attorney Frank Cacciatore was ready. Mosley was a panther, a beast roaming the streets of Queens in the dead of night, he shouted at the courtroom. Judge J. Irwin Shapiro instructed the jury on the insanity plea. Legal sanity means a person must be held criminally responsible for his conduct, unless he had such a defect of reason that he cannot distinguish between right and wrong, he said. And through all of the arguing and summations, which lasted into the late afternoon of June 11th, 1964, Winston Mosley sat calmly in his seat at the defense table. Jury deliberations began at 4 p.m. at the Queen's Supreme Court building, just a few minutes' walk from Austin Street where Catherine was murdered three months before. By 10.30 p.m., less than seven hours later, a verdict was reached. Mosley was found guilty of murder in the first degree. He stood motionless as he heard the jury announce its decision. He made no outward signs of emotion. When asked by the court clerk of his date of birth, he said, I was born on March 2, 1935, Manhattan. Graduate of high school, I occasionally go to church. Then, court officers took him away. There were only about ten spectators present when the verdict was announced. Most people thought there would not be a verdict until Monday and had left for the weekend. Conspicuous in their absence was the Genovese family. No one from the family had ever visited the courtroom. None of us went to the trial, not even mom or dad, said Bill Genovese. We tried to protect the family from the publicity, especially mom. We hid the newspaper articles from her. 
On Monday, June 15, 1964, Mosley was brought back to Queens County Supreme Court for sentencing. This time, the courtroom was packed with spectators and reporters. The prosecution was allowed to introduce any matters which they deem relevant to show aggravating circumstances of the defendant's behavior. Four women testified that Mosley had also attacked them. He had beaten one of them, whipped another, and robbed all four. The testimony was graphic and had an emotional impact on the jury. Life imprisonment isn't that at all. This monster can live to stalk the streets again, pleaded Assistant District Attorney Frank Cacciatore. The jury retired to consider the sentence. A short time later, they announced their decision. We, the jury, recommend the death penalty, the jury foreman said to the court. The room erupted into loud, spontaneous applause and cheers. Judge Shapiro pounded his gavel to restore order. I've never seen anything like this. Never, not at such a time, said a veteran court officer to reporters. Once the clamor had settled down and people took their seats again, the judge added his own thoughts. I don't believe in capital punishment, but when I see this monster, he said, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the switch myself. When he was arrested in March 1964, Mosley was 28 years old. He owned a house in Queens, was married, and had two children. He had a steady job and no criminal record. But Catherine was not his only victim. He committed dozens of burglaries and rapes, which he later admitted to the police and at his trial. I chose women to kill because they were easier and didn't fight back, he once said. After his conviction, Mosley was remanded to the Department of Corrections and eventually shipped to Attica Prison. In 1967, the New York State Court of Appeals found that evidence of Mosley's mental condition should have been admitted into trial. His death sentence was reduced to life imprisonment. But, in 1968, during a routine transfer to a hospital in Buffalo, Mosley managed to overpower a guard and steal his gun. He later took five people hostage and raped a woman in front of her husband. The FBI located the escaped killer in a second-floor apartment in downtown Buffalo. A courageous FBI agent named Neil Welsh managed to enter the apartment and, for a nail-biting half-hour, Mosley and Welsh pointed guns at each other point-blank while they continued negotiations. Mosley later surrendered. He was shipped back to Attica Prison where he became just another lifer. Over the years, Mosley, like a lot of other convicts who realized they may never get out of prison, became somewhat philosophical. Prison, as it presently stands, is an inherently evil place that insidiously and systematically works to destroy imprisoned persons, he said later. He was at Attica in September 1971 when a bloody riot erupted, killing 10 guards and 29 prisoners. I went through a trial of fire and death, he said in a letter to the New York Times. The 71 Attica Rebellion profoundly affected me. I vowed right then and there that I was going to get on the right track and make amends for my past wrongdoing. In 1977, Mosley wrote a long letter to the Times, airing his thoughts on his killings and life in prison. As for the Catherine Genovese murder, he said, The crime was tragic, but it did serve society, urging it as it did to come to the aid of its members in danger or distress. The Times, apparently seeing something profound in Mosley's words, saw fit to publish the entire article in its op-ed section under the alluring title, Today I'm a Man Who Wants to Be an Asset, on April 11, 1977. The story spanned four columns, replete with graphics and Mosley's own description of a different and constructive multiple killer. The man who killed Kitty Genovese in Queens in 1964 is no more, Mosley wrote. Another vastly different individual has emerged, a Winston Mosley intent and determined to do constructive, not destructive things. Mosley realized he'd become eligible for parole and he began a concentrated effort to gain release from prison. He read books from the prison library and, using taxpayer funds, was able to enroll in a college program. In the late 1970s, he became one of the first inmates in New York State to earn a college degree when he received a BA in sociology from Niagara University. He wrote letters to newspapers and continued his campaign to obtain a parole. During the period of 1984 through 1995, Mosley appeared before the State Parole Board six times. His appearances were marked by his bizarre, self-serving comments to the panel, and he frequently assumed the role of society's victim. For a victim outside, 
It's a one-time or one-hour or one-minute affair, but for the person who's caught, it's forever, he said in 1984. People do kill people when they mug them sometimes, he added. At one parole hearing, Mosley claimed he had written a letter to the Genovese family to apologize for the inconvenience I caused. The Genovese family strongly denied receiving any such communication, nor did they wish for one. In 1995, at the age of 60, Mosley thought he had found a way out of prison. He appealed to a federal court to give him a new trial because he claimed that his attorney, Sidney Sparrow, had a conflict of interest during his trial. Sparrow had once represented Catherine Genovese on a minor gambling charge and, therefore, Mosley surmised, he could not represent him when he was accused of her murder. This time, however, the Genovese family did attend. All three brothers, Vince, Frank, and Bill, who lost both legs in 1967 during the Vietnam War, and a sister, Susan, were there. It was tough to hear it all again, said Bill, but it was tougher on Vince who testified. Sparrow, then 82 years old, also attended the hearing and later said that Mosley was a liar, trying to get out of prison any way he can. On November 13, 1995, a federal judge denied Mosley's request for a new trial, saying that Sparrow in 1964 gave Mosley effective, competent, and capable counsel under difficult circumstances. He was returned to prison once again. For the families of murder victims, there is never closure, only a periodic respite from the sorrow that once dominated their lives. A long time has passed since the murder in Kew Gardens, but in many ways, it's still recent for those who loved Catherine. From time to time, the press still calls on the Genovese family. I was consulted in a project for the History Channel, said Bill, the ex-Marine and Vietnam veteran. He lost his legs in combat on a Friday the 13th, the same day that Catherine was killed, but three years later. See, they're going to do the story anyway, so we might as well cooperate, he said. Vince nodded his head in agreement. At least we have some measure of control if we cooperate he said. Of the 38 witnesses, the family had little to say. It was shocking, devastating, awful. Our sister could have been saved, Vince said. I don't know who they are even. I didn't want to talk to any of them. The witnesses, however, and their failure to take action on the night of March 13, 1964, will never be forgotten. In the past four decades, Catherine's murder has been absorbed into the vast psychological database of human behavioral science to be studied, analyzed, picked apart in classrooms, and written about in college textbooks. But that development intends no disrespect for her death. Her case came to symbolize the corruption of modern city life, a life in which everyone is too frightened or too selfish to help another person, a life in which the value of humanitarianism has been forgotten, writes Professor Helen Benedict of Columbia University. Mosley was denied parole an 18th time in November 2015, and died in prison on March 28, 2016, at the age of 81. He had served 52 years, making him one of the longest-serving inmates in the New York State prison system. Ray and Faye Copeland aren't the only husband and wife killers, but they may be the most bizarre. Not only did they commit multiple murders together, but they were both eligible for Social Security at the time of their crimes. Little information is readily available, and few studies have been conducted on perpetrators over the age of 60. According to the 2000 Russian Journal of Psychiatry, most elderly murderers demonstrate a close relationship between pre-senile, senile disorders, and social psychological factors, and more than half demonstrate clear evidence of psychopathology. Another study conducted that same year by the Medical Correctional Authority showed that most of those sent to prison for the first time when 60 or older had committed crimes of passion. Ray and Faye were convicted of killing five men, and none of them were crimes of passion. That's not to say that they were in their right minds at the time. Perhaps by looking at the complete picture, we can get a better understanding of what drove them to kill. On August 20th, 1989, the Nebraska Crime Stoppers hotline logged a call from 57-year-old Jack McCormick. He had recently moved from Missouri, where he had witnessed several events that made him fear for his life. He had worked on a farm for an elderly couple named Ray and Faye Copeland, who would use drifters to commit crimes involving the sale of livestock. 
In the beginning, he was unaware of the illegal activities, but he eventually realized what was going on. McCormick said Mr. Copeland eventually became aware of his suspicions and tried to kill him, which is why he fled. As the conversation came to a close, McCormick mentioned that he had seen several human bones on the farm. Nebraska authorities, while somewhat skeptical of the story, notified detectives in Missouri. Copeland had a long arrest record for forgery and cattle theft, so Missouri authorities took the tip very seriously. They spent the next few months gathering evidence and used McCormick's statements to secure a search warrant. On the morning of October 9, 1989, Sheriff Leland O'Dell, along with as many as 40 officers, several backhoes, and teams of bloodhounds, descended upon the Copeland farm. With such a large area to cover, Odell needed all the help he could get. After spending a week scouring the farm and surrounding property, investigators had not found any evidence to back up McCormick's story. Some were beginning to wonder if they had made a terrible mistake. Nonetheless, on October 17, 1989, all doubts were put to rest. Investigators discovered three bodies in a local barn Ray Copeland was known to use. Each one was buried in a separate grave, and they were later identified as 21-year-old Paul Jason Coart from Dardanelle, Arkansas, 27-year-old John W. Freeman from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and 27-year-old Jimmy Dale Harvey from Springfield, Missouri. All three had died from a single gunshot wound to the back of the skull. The following week, investigators searched another barn Ray was known to use. More than a dozen deputies and volunteers spent several hours removing 2,000 bales of hay, which was stacked ceiling high. Investigators discovered a body wrapped in black plastic beneath the barn floor. The victim had also been killed by a single gunshot to the back of the head. He was later identified as Wayne Warner, age unknown. During a search of Ray's home, investigators seized a 22 caliber Marlin bolt-action rifle. According to the Kansas City Star, Ballistic tests later revealed it was the weapon used in each murder. Investigators also discovered a handwritten list of farm helpers in Faye's writing. Twelve of the names had scrawled X's by them. Five of those men turned up dead, and investigators suspected that the others, who turned out to be missing, were also dead. In addition, they also found a quilt which Faye had made from the clothing of the murdered men. As the search began to wind down, investigators made one final discovery. While examining an old well close to where Warner's body was found, they discovered the body of another man. He was later identified as 27-year-old Dennis Murphy. As with the others, his death resulted from a single bullet to the back of the head. Prosecutors were quick to offer Faye Copeland a deal. If she were to tell investigators where more bodies might be found, they would only charge her with conspiracy to commit murder and she would serve a few months in jail for her cooperation. Regardless, Faye claimed to have no knowledge of any of the murders. Both Ray and Faye Copeland were arraigned on five counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors did not want to take any chances, and Ray was taken to a state mental hospital for evaluation. The last thing the state wanted was an insanity defense. The public defender's office knew it would be hard to defend the couple together, so they filed for a motion to have the cases tried separately. No one knew for certain which direction the trial would take, but everyone suspected Faye would have a better chance on her own. The prosecution was playing hardball, and rather than life in prison, they were seeking the death penalty in both cases. Ray Copeland was born in Oklahoma during 1914, just as World War I was beginning in Europe. Ray's parents, Jess and Laney Copeland, moved around frequently as he was growing up and eventually settled in Ozark Hills, Arkansas. By this time, Ray's mother had given birth to a daughter and another son. Following the conflict in Europe, the Great Depression began. In order to survive, every person had to contribute to the family's survival. Ray was no exception, and during his fourth grade of schooling, he dropped out to help with a family's small farm. Little is known about Ray's adolescent years, but friends of the family later described him to Miller as stubborn and insubordinate. Ray's life of crime started at the age of 20, when he stole two hogs from his father and sold them in another town. His father later found out, but no formal charges were ever filed. For the next several years, Ray continued to commit petty thefts. The majority of his illegal activities revolved around the theft of livestock, but he eventually started to commit more serious crimes. In 1936, 
He was arrested in Harrison, Arkansas, and charged with forging government checks. He was later sentenced to one year in the county jail. After serving out his sentence, Ray moved back to his parents' farm. There's no public record of his activities for the next three years, so he either managed to stay out of trouble during this time, or he was more careful in the crimes he chose to commit. Things began to look up for Ray during the spring of 1940. During a routine visit to a physician's office, he met a young girl named Faye Della Wilson. The fair-haired 19-year-old was the daughter of Rufus and Gladys Wilson, a hard-working couple from Harrison, Arkansas. Faye's parents had very little money, but they did manage to raise seven children in a dirt floor cabin. Ray and Faye quickly hit it off, and less than six months later, they were married. Within a year of their nuptials, the couple had a boy, whom they named Everett. Two years later, Faye gave birth to another child, Billy Ray. In 1944, Ray decided to move his growing family to Fresno County, California. The following year, the couple's first and only girl, Betty Lou, was born. Two years later, in 1947, the couple's third son, Alvia, was born. In 1949, Ray was accused of stealing horses from a local farmer. No charges were filed, but Ray's reputation was severely damaged. Later that same year, Faye gave birth to the couple's fifth child, William Wayne. Due to suspected horse thefts, Ray was unable to find steady work, so he eventually moved his family back to Arkansas. The Copelands were in Arkansas for less than a month when Ray was arrested for cattle theft. Charged with grand larceny, he was convicted and sentenced to one year in jail. Upon his release from prison, Ray moved his family to Rocky Comfort, Missouri. The change in scenery did not help, and in 1951, Ray was again arrested for cattle theft. He was sentenced to manual labor on the judge's farm. In 1953, Ray moved his family to Illinois. Over the next eight years, the Copelands moved from town to town, and Ray was arrested on at least three separate occasions for writing bad checks. Fines and jail time did little to deter Ray, and he continued to dabble in illegal activities. In 1961, Ray paid for 20 head of cattle with a $2,960 check. The seller soon discovered the check was no good, and Ray was arrested and sentenced to nine months behind bars. Directly after his release, Ray passed another bad check during the purchase of 19 head of cattle. He was again arrested and sentenced to another nine months in jail. After his last stint in jail, Ray finally came to the realization that something needed to change. He was spending more time as a prisoner than he was a free man. Unfortunately, rather than change his actions, he ultimately decided he needed to change his methods. He needed to formulate a new game plan, and he decided to go straight until he could figure out the details. During the summer of 1966, Ray decided it was time to move once again, and he took his family to Missouri. The following year, the Copeland clan purchased a small farm with 40 acres of land. They paid $6,000 for their new home, which was located in Mooresville, Missouri. They were in desperate need of money, so Faye took a job at Midwest Quality Gloves Corporation. Over the course of the next several years, many of Ray's neighbors began to loathe him. They viewed him as a penny-pinching old man, and several suspected he beat his wife and children. His wife and kids would verify these suspicions many years later. Ray had a keen eye for cattle, and he knew a good deal when he saw one. His only problem was he never had any money. As the old saying goes, it takes money to make money. So by the early 1970s, Ray began working out the details of his new plan. He knew he could not continue writing bad checks. He never got away with it in the past, and the last thing he wanted was to be sent back to jail. His arrest record was long enough, and another arrest could send him away for a substantial period of time. No, he knew he could not risk doing that himself. But then he wondered if he could convince someone else to do it for him. Someone no one knew, and someone who could disappear without rousing any suspicion. The plan needed some work, but he was certain he had stumbled onto something feasible. Once Ray worked out the details, he began showing up at cattle auctions with hitchhikers and drifters. The two men would sit on opposite sides of each other during the sales, and Ray would signal whenever he wanted a particular group of livestock. When it came time to complete the purchase, Ray would have the man write out a check from Ray's book and sign his name to it. The check would eventually bounce, but by then, Ray would already have sold the cattle. 
When law enforcement confronted him about the checks, Ray would pretend to have no knowledge of the sales and would proclaim his innocence by pointing out the signatures on the checks were not in his handwriting. Hence, no charges could be filed against him. The scam was not very sophisticated, but surprisingly, he was able to pull it off dozens of times. Ray used several different drifters, and all of them would disappear after the sales. Ray felt he had formulated the perfect plan, but he did not count on the determination of local law enforcement to prove his involvement in the cattle scams. Investigators eventually caught up with one of the drifters. The man, Gerald Perkins, was cooperative with detectives, and he provided them with a detailed account of Ray's schemes. Ray was quickly arrested and ended up serving almost two years in jail for check forgery. After his release from prison, Ray managed to stay out of trouble for several years. He still felt his plan was successful, if in need of some minor adjustments. By the mid-1980s, Ray had fine-tuned his last scheme and was eagerly putting it into operation. He would still use drifters, the only difference being he would not have them write checks from his account. Instead, he would have them get a post office box and open an account in their own name and have them write checks from their own account at various livestock auctions. Ray would explain this to them by saying the auctioneers disliked him and would not give him a fair shake. Once the drifter wore out his welcome, Ray would see to it that he disappeared for good. On November 1, 1990, 69-year-old Faye Copeland went to trial. According to articles in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Faye's defense was that her husband had committed the killings without her knowledge. She claimed she was both a bystander and a victim of battered woman syndrome. As evidence of her guilt, prosecutors presented the list and quilt discovered during a search of the farm. The jury found her guilty of five counts of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced her to death by lethal injection for four of the counts and life without parole for the fifth. Upon hearing her sentence, Faye Copeland sobbed uncontrollably. The morning after Faye's verdict, a sheriff involved in the case was transporting Ray Copeland to a Kansas City hospital for another mental examination. During the trip, the sheriff began questioning Ray about Faye's trial. You hear about the verdict, Ray? Nah, what happened? Well, they found her guilty and recommended execution for her, Ray. Well, those things happen to some you know, he responded. Ray never asked about Faye again. On March 7, 1991, 76-year-old Ray Copeland went to trial. After weeks of testimony and the admittance of the prosecution's ballistic test results, a jury of his peers found him guilty on all five counts of first-degree murder. He was then sentenced to death by lethal injection. Upon hearing the verdict, Ray simply mumbled, I'm okay. Ray and Faye Copeland became the oldest couple in American history ever sentenced to death. Two years later, while awaiting execution at the Potosi Correctional Center, 78-year-old Ray Copeland died. To this day, many investigators believe Ray was responsible for other murders, which have yet to be discovered. On August 6, 1999, U.S. District Judge Ortree Smith overturned the death sentence for 78-year-old Faye Copeland. Faye's attorney was quoted by the Columbia Daily Tribune as saying, The evidence of Faye's guilt was pretty thin. Faye just happened to be there. She worked in the greenhouse at the prison every day. She wouldn't hurt a fly. I think you can ask the warden, and he would say he could open the door and there wouldn't be a danger to anybody. Faye's attorney filed the appeal because the Livingston County jury that convicted her was not allowed to hear evidence of battered woman syndrome. Even though the death penalty was no longer an issue, the judge allowed her murder convictions to stand and she was ordered to remain in prison for the rest of her life. Several women's activist groups began to protest Faye's imprisonment, claiming she had suffered enough and that she presented no threat to society. But their requests to commute her sentence to time served fell upon deaf ears. Two weeks after her sentencing, Faye Copeland gave a rare interview to Lee Cavanaugh of the Kansas City Star. The following are excerpts from that interview. I couldn't have flowers at home. He didn't like me to be tending to anything other than him. As long as I was with him, or working the cattle or the tractor, that was okay. But flowers? No, he didn't like them. I was raised to love my husband and support him no matter what. The man is the head of the family. The Bible says it should be that way. It wouldn't do to say if Ray was mean to me or not. Yes, he did mess up my life, but that's not to say that I wasn't a good wife to him. 
I was never mean to him. Maybe we'd have got along better if I'd knocked the shit out of him a few times. I've often thought since, maybe this was for the best. Where did I go wrong, if I went wrong? I know one place was getting married at all, but he was my life for many, many years. I didn't know anything else. Will I get out? I may go out feet first, but I'll get out of here. Someday. In November of 2000, Missouri Attorney General J. Nixon appealed Judge Smith's ruling and asked the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals to reinstate Faye's death sentence. But the Federal Appeals Court upheld the decision. Faye remained quiet during most of the proceedings, but when asked if she had anything to say, she stood up, stating at that hearing, I think I've paid for what I did, or what I knew. God will forgive me for anything I've said or done. Afterward, Faye's son, Al Copeland, spoke briefly with the Associated Press and said he had been pressing for his mother's release since she was imprisoned. There's no way in the world Mum could have done what they said she had done, he said. But in regards to his father, Al said, He was guilty. I have no qualms about that. The following month, Tom and Jeanette Block, founders of Missourians Against State Killing, or MASK, began fighting to have Faye released from prison. They desperately sought the public's help and requested the people send letters of support for Faye. During this time, this author contacted the group and later received the following reply. While we are grateful that Faye is out of danger of execution, we are disappointed that she will remain in prison for the rest of her life. We have an application for clemency pending before Governor Wilson, asking that he commute her sentence to time served. I have attached a copy of the petition. Anyone interested in helping could write and urge the governor to grant our petition. Thanks for your support. Sean D. O'Brien, Public Interest Litigation Clinic. On August 10, 2002, Faye Copeland suffered a stroke, which left her partially paralyzed and unable to speak. Weeks later, she was paroled to a nursing home in her hometown. The following year, on December 30, 2003, 82-year-old Faye Copeland died at the Morningside Center Nursing Home from what Livingston County Coroner Scott Lindsay described as natural causes. They finally gained freedom, even if it was feet first. Mm-hmm.